Uh, it's the lighting. Oh, it's wow. kind of like lighting. a, yeah, it's kind of like a, it's more of an off-white, but I mean, I guess off-white is yellowish, so yeah. <laughs> might be splitting hairs here. Um, okay. Welcome, 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 everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. I see you in the live chat. Thank you. I'm here with Tade Sueya, <laughs> still practicing my fluency okay. with his beautiful last name. Um, and he's a geneticist and also a fellow professor at SUNY downtown in Brooklyn, downstate, New York. Downstate, downstate. downstate. Thank you. Um, and we are connected because of my work through theory of racistness and because of his interest in genetics as it pertains to this idea of race. So today we're looking to have a conversation that ranges anywhere from talking about race as a social construction to race and education, race and genetics, if you have questions, sound off in the live chat. We're definitely going to tend to the questions at the conclusion of this conversation. If this is your first time coming here, I'm Dr. Sheena Mason. I am the host of Free Your Mind, the creator and president of Theory of Racistness, an educational consulting business where people go to free themselves from racism. Today, are you ready? Let's right. talk. Awesome. Yeah. So I want to pass the mic to you and invite you to say anything you want listeners to know about yourself. Who are you? I'm a statistical uh, geneticist at SUNY. Um, I make YouTube videos about statistics and I dunk basketballs for a hobby. I grew up um, um, doing sports and I ran track and field. And so I still run track. And then that sort of combined with my my like my interest in you know in genes and track obviously that's like that's a uh, a, a cultural um like uh, kind of sort of important point right so uh, there's a lot of race talked about and you know who runs fast and who um, um jumps high so i spend a lot of time talking about that just because i know both of those fields and people really care about that and then i've trained a lot of people to jump higher and run faster and I've just been exposed to like a lot of, um, as an athlete myself, and now a little bit more as a coach, I, I just keep seeing how much people believe in this. And yes, it's not that important to jump high. It's somewhat of a trivial endeavor, especially like um, dunking basketballs. Although, I mean, it's a job, people do it, but there's not a ton, a ton of like, of uh, you can't make a living doing it unless you're really good. But if people are so handicapped, in their ability to do something so simple as jump high because of their conceptions about race, then like, what does that say about uh, like schoolwork or doing math, right? So I think it is actually a really important example, right? So it's, it's safe to talk about or more safe, but it kind of just shows that, you know, if you believe something, it, it can really hurt you or help you. And, you know, people sort of, when it comes to race, almost everything we believe is wrong. That's, that's, Rather than say race doesn't exist, I, I think I'm more in favor of the idea that everything we do say about it isn't true. Thank you so much. Um, I was I was giggling over the commentary about the significance of being able to jump high. Um, I want to know, like, what events did you do in track? I ran the 100, the 200, the 60. Nice. So you're I, I didn't a jump in track. I started to jump when I actually tore my hamstring in track. I couldn't run for a while. And then I started to jump. And I, I mean, I wasn't great at it initially. I'd obviously like running track helped, but I had to sort of train myself up and learn how to jump. And then, so then I started to like dunk basketballs and I started to train people to dunk. So I did like dunk contests and all that kind of stuff. So it was fun. It sounds fun. That's why I'm interested. I um, ran track a long time ago, but did run track. Um, I also did cross country, so I was forced to do the 3000 meter, oh, which wow. was like horrendous. I absolutely despised it. And I remember, and I'll probably always remember this when the coach got changed in high school, 
I was able to actually choose what I wanted to do. And I, I really gravitated toward 400 and I was in 400 relay. And sometimes I would do the 800 because it was a sort of happy in between the that's distance. Crazy, that's a crazy event to want to do as well, though. That's, I mean, I ran, <laughs> I ran 400 meters this morning, actually. So I ran in like 50 something seconds, 55 seconds, I think. And I did at the end of my workout and it was absolutely horrible. Nice. So, yeah. I can't imagine why oh. you want to do, do the eight. But I guess it's better than the 3000. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> way better than yeah. the 3000 what um yeah. yeah and like people people probably don't know this about me but i've spent a lot of time in the fitness industry actually before we got on camera when i was telling you all the places i lived it was largely because i worked for a company called 24 hour fitness i was um initially a service representative lead i worked my way up to general manager and i got recruited to all these different clubs around the country to um, do different, to do different roles and to essentially help the clubs that were struggling. Um, and I ended my career in San Jose, California with a team of just under 100 employees. And at that time I was also doing natural figure competitions. So bodybuilding was a thing. (laughs) Um, so I have, I guess I'm a, a sort of a glutton for punishment because not a lot of people can actually do bodybuilding competitively. And I did. And one of my goals and current aspirations still is to get back on stage and I want to earn my pro card, all of that stuff. So I'm I'm also very much into fitness, um, if you can't tell. And coincidentally, perhaps also very much into race and into how people understand and think about race. So you said earlier that you, you're not inclined to necessarily prove the or disprove the existence of race, though I know in our communication you've said, um, surprise, surprise, it doesn't really exist, right? But you do lean into um, the, the recognition and awareness of the fact that what most people presume about race is wrong. So tell me more about that. Um, I've, we're connected on Twitter. I've seen you, I've called on you a lot. I've taken advantage of the fact that you know all this stuff that I don't. Uh, people talking about sickle cell, people talking about all of these things which they attach to race, including one's ability to, to jump higher or run faster. Um, and yeah, just feel inspired to enter the conversation from whatever direction. Yes, I mean, obviously it's complex. We're we're talking about that before. And you have to sort of talk about how you conceptualize race to talk about whether or not it has utility, right? So if you, again, if you conceptualize it incredibly simple, if race is a demarcation between skin color, right? And everyone on the side, on, on one side of the line is white and everyone on the other side is black. It doesn't matter where you're from then okay, like that's race and you have something and it could be informative, right? If again, like I, I was making a joke, but you know, if, if I said, if I only had one bottle of uh, sunscreen left, I'd give it to a redhead, right? So sure, right? Like it's gonna tell you something about how dark you are, how much resistance to the sun you have. But I mean, that's not gonna give you any answers about um, like where your ancestors come from, right? So this, okay, so you can have a phenotypic race, right? White and black, based on some color of skin. Of course, you know, we're going to get tan in the summer and maybe we're going to cross over sometimes, but fine, right? And then, but the idea is that there's something out there that has utility like that for uh, sunscreen and actually a lot more utility and is a strong reflection of who your ancestors were for the last 10,000 years or 20,000 years or some, you know, some amount of time. And that I think is what, what's not true. Right. So you kind of can't have both. You can talk about your ancestry and you can talk about um, separating us by how we look, but trying to do both just doesn't work very well. And I think why it doesn't work is actually really interesting. And we didn't really know why it doesn't work. What's kind of cool about um, Luantin and these guys is to be fair and the HBD group, you know, they don't they don't like these guys. And they have one fair point that these guys kind of guessed they kind of guessed that sub sub speciation in humans doesn't exist. And they were kind of right, but they didn't really know. And I think it's in the last 10 years that we've really learned this, right? So I think it is something that it's fair to not assume it, but it's, we basically learned that ancient humans and like ancient DNA, whenever we find it, it always shocks us. 
right? It's never, it never matches really the modern people that come from that place. And so there's an example, um, there's a cave in Morocco, they find um, some, um, some bones from there and they estimate they're, you know, 10 to 12,000 years old, right? So this is obviously a long time ago. This is before Christ, before um, Islam, before the um, Arabs got there, before all of that stuff. But like 40% of the DNA, you know, its closest match, and of course it's, it's pretty ancient DNA, so it's not going to match exactly. Its closest match is to a group of people, uh, is to actually some other less ancient uh, DNA that's like 3,000 years old, and it's in the Near East, right? So the Middle East. And then the other half of the DNA, its most similar match to any DNA we have now is to a, people, a group of people called the Hadza, and it's 500 people, hunter-gatherers in Tanzania, that until now we thought that they were 60,000 year old genetic isolate, which means they have no common ancestors with anyone anywhere else in the world for about 60,000 years. But they were in Morocco, or there's some people that look like them in Morocco like 12,000 years ago, right? So you see that there's just these inexplicable findings that, that keep on happening where there's just a lot we don't know about the past. And it's not surprising, right? We only know about it if some bones happen to get, you know, preserved in a cave. But so I think that what we're seeing is that our ancestors traveled far more than we thought. And, and additionally, like one thing that I should add is to the way we talk about, like if you're gonna talk about race and like where you come from, you have to choose a time, right? And interestingly, no one chooses like now, no one chooses, their grandparents right so no one says i'm american because my grandparents came from you know from that like my grandparents were born here right i mean if you're black you're talking about your ancestry from like 300 years ago right you're ignoring the current um like the the last what, five six seven generations and you're saying i'm black because i'm from africa and i and my ancestors were there at, at some point in time right so okay, you can find out where your ancestors were a thousand years ago. And that's also sort of what we do. And it is weird that we sort of fix this point in time. And A, we're kind of sloppy about it. But B, it's also like, why is this point in time fixed? So for example, if you're French, you know, we know that the French were Gauls, right? So we know that they were in Germany 2000 years ago. But the French don't have any pride for being like from someplace, you know, yeah, well, what is it? 800 miles uh, northeast of France, they're French, right? Because to them, again, they say, okay, you know, I'm French because masters have, have been French, you know, for a long time. And even before they were Gauls, they were probably in the Near East. And before that, they're probably in somewhere in like East Africa, because, you know, of course, all humans do probably come from like somewhere in Africa. Like that's pretty much agreed upon. But yet, we have to choose a time, right? So the reason we choose a thousand years ago or so, I, I mean, I haven't actually asked someone who, who really uh, cares about that, but I think the, the reason why we kind of pick that time is we think, okay, we didn't have big ships. We didn't have planes. So wherever your ancestors were a thousand years ago, they were also there for the last 8,000 years before that. And that's why it makes sense, but that's not true. So that's sort of the big thing, right? Like, sure. You could also fix where they were 100 years ago. You could choose a thousand. You could choose two thousand. Of course, the farther back you go, the the you can't be as sure. But the idea of having an ancestry for most people is really a question of where were the majority of my ancestors 1,000 years ago. And then if that's totally different than 2,000 years ago, and that's totally different than 3,000 years ago, then it's kind of what's the point? Because the reason why we don't do where your ancestors were 100 years ago. Is because we know it's not the same, especially in this country, right? In like the U.S., where your ancestors were 100 years ago is, I mean, for probably the majority of people, is not where they were 500 years ago. So it doesn't matter, right? That's not ancestry. That's just uh, travel. That's like migration. But I just, I, I don't think there exists a time of stability. That's my big point, right? I don't think that exists. So it's, it's you know, maybe in the new world maybe like you know so to give those people a bone i'll say yeah you know maybe if you're a native american you, just, you can be pretty confident that three thousand um years ago your ancestors were probably in the americas so maybe a little bit you know but for the most part i don't think this is a useful conception to 
rewind a thousand years and say where Manchester were then really matters because if they were there then, then they were there for the previous you know 10,000 or 5,000 years. I don't think, I think what we're seeing is that's not true. So part of what, what I'm hearing then is, because you spoke about, um, you spoke about what could be viewed as a sort of naturalist uh, conception of race. That is to say, uh, if I'm a naturalist and I think of race as having to do with biology, which people associate with phenotype, people associate with ancestry, you're saying those people often link those two things. Um, uh, but there's a way in which a naturalist description of race, if based on those things, what could be viewed as or stated as a sort of matter of fact um, statement, right? Like I, I've heard from people in Jamaica, for example, who they say in, in Jamaica, to be black is to be, it is, it is a matter of fact. And before I think, before we went live, I think we we're talking about a, an example from Brazil. So there are different countries or in different times where race in the language that we talk about it in American society is viewed more so as just a, a matter of fact, a statement, an observation even, right? It doesn't, it's not necessarily freighted with the meaning and sig signification that most Americans tend to give it. And then that causes a sort of disruption for folks who come from these, these other places who have a, that conception of race, which leans toward the sort of naturalist conception of race, they come here and then they experience race in the American context and it's something very different and it can be jarring too. And it can, it can cause some uneasiness because all of a sudden now to be racialized as black means not just how you look, right? Or, or your ancestry it means those things. And it means how you participate in culture. You know, it, it means like all the it's things. Everything. It's like everything. Like, like yeah. Everything under the it's sun. Incredible, right? It's, 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 yeah, it's truly incredible. Like how so, we basically have just kind of added them all together. And the, I think it's because we can't have a naturalist conception because to have, to have a strong naturalist uh, conception and to have it mean something, um, like I said, okay, it, it can mean a few things. It can mean who who should get the sunscreen if you're about to like run out. It can mean that, but to have it mean more than that, you kind of have to be racist, right? Because you have to say in Brazil, you have to say, oh, I had twins and they're, you know, two girls and one is white and one is black and the white one's pretty and the black one's not, right? So like, mm. because otherwise it's like, why would I even say that? you know, because there's no difference really, right? So if it's just gonna be, if I'm gonna put you in a category because of the color of your skin, it has to be because I think that really matters, right? So mm -hmm. for to have a true, pure phenotypic, yes, you avoid the problems with like, you're like ancestry, but you basically, you're gonna have to give up on race when, I mean, in some ways it's good, right? Cause there's a nice off ramp. If we've been discriminated against people purely on the color of their skin, then when we stop doing that, race goes away, right? Because that no longer matters, right? But I think part of the reason why we've moved away from that here and we went into like where your parents came from is this, this big argument, well, I'm not racist, but other people are and people were in the past. So I'm making this guess about your past, right? About like your ancestors and your mom and your dad and like what they experienced. So I'm looking at you and seeing your parents, which is a just just insane, right? It's just it's it's a lot to think about, right? It's just it's too much to really for us to really have a like relationship with someone if we have to think about all that when we see them. Well, if we if we so in the American context, part of how ancestry and, and lineage, lineage come into the conversation is because in around the 1660s, uh, that's when you get the sort of infamous calculations of blackness, right? At what point does a person stop being black? And then the motivating factor for those calculations was to determine at what point should a person not be enslaved anymore because if if there is if there is a if there's a magic figure you know 20 generations down all of a, now you're white right it it 
so in that in that way it became more about the the one drop rule the metaphorical blood but it was used for political economic social cultural reasons and in those days <laughs> it feels funny saying that but in those days um there's a way in which phenotype wouldn't matter because your phenotype could completely disrupt one's current conception of race as pertaining to phenotype. Uh, because if, if your parentage or your ancestry was such that the one drop rule applied to you, and we can think of Walter White or Gene Toomer, we can think of countless who were direct descendants of enslaved folks, um, it doesn't matter if you look white, you're black. And it was, it's, it's, it's pernicious because that same line of thinking then across decades turns, it turns from primarily ancestry based for the reasons I've described into now it's ancestry and it's how you look. So there's a little bit of a moving away from, okay, you can look like a Walter White and still be identified as Black because the one drop rule, because if you look white, then you have what people call white privilege, right? And so we're, we're making all these presumptions. And, but also morally, we would identify the Walter Whites of the world as being immoral or unethical for not identifying and naming his blackness because we still believe in the one drop rule. Yeah. Uh, but, but definitely precedence is put upon does one look to be of a particular race. And then also it's icing on the cake because the presumption is that if you look a certain way, then your ancestry is a certain way as you're saying. So it's become, it's interesting to think about the manifestations and sort of genealogy of these concepts, as well as how it operates in different spaces well, across we time. Them, right, that's the issue is we've, in our current conception, our past conception was a little bit mixed, but now they're even more mixed. Like they're just mm. intertwined. And there's examples of the exact opposite, right? So in France, in like aristocratic, or in like the, in Senegal, right? When the French took uh, Senegal, you can actually go there and they have uh, these houses and they would have the virgin slaves and they would have sex with the French guys. And if they had a son, their son was white. He was a nobleman because he was French. If they had a daughter, then, then she's black. Right. So they would hope to have sons. And I mean, you've probably heard of um, Alexander Dumas mm -hmm. and right. And so his so he's a his father was one of these people. His father was a child of a black slave and a and a French landowner. And the French do a little trick now where they do some revisionist history. Right. And they say, wow, we had the first black uh, general because I mean, he was he was a a general in the army in like, I don't know, 18, like 40, I'm probably getting the date wrong, but really a long time ago, right? And they brag about this and they say we had a black, you know, general and the USA didn't get their first one until Colin Powell. And that was in the 90s, right? So we're way, way ahead on race and diversity, but it's, it's, it's not true. He was just white because they conceptualized race through the father and you now like a son of a white man was white, right? So that, which sounds insane, but that's truly like their ancestry right it doesn't matter like how you look right if you're a woman and you have a black mother then you're black and if you're if you have a white father and it it wasn't even white right it was french right so we talk about white in the us but they didn't they don't need like whiteness or any concept because he's, he's french right so it's all the you know all the rules and all like like the rights of a frenchman which maybe a polish guy wouldn't get right so it's, it's not that that gave him white privilege but that made him french Right. And so that's weird. But the way that they did in, in France, OK, it, it's it's just basically a question about the the father of a man. Right. Purely lineage. Right. One generation. Right. And non non like phenotypic. And OK, you look at, you know, Brazil and it's fully phenotype. Right? And, you, and you know, there's not probably one that's fully phenotype, but you can imagine one that is. Because probably in Brazil, the tiebreaker is they look, at, they look at your parents, right? But you can imagine one where you're just strictly, you know, skin color, right? I mean, I guess if you're if you're asking about your risk for skin cancer, we don't call that race, but that conception of, of the different uh, colors of skin, right? That's purely a phenotypic, you know, conception. And then 
we have this mixed one and we also strangely don't invent new races when it's appropriate to, right? So there's a group of people that are American descendants of slaves. And they, they have this argument that they should be first in line for like, for, you know, for because the US uh, government uniquely harmed their ancestors. And as an ancestral claim, right? They're, they are a race because they are people that share shared lineage. Like one of their ancestors was brought to, was brought from Africa to America, probably one or more, right? But they don't say that, but they just say, oh no, we're black people and people who come to America from, you know, like West Africa are also black people, but we're American descendants of slaves. But why aren't they a race, right? That's, they're basically making a claim that's about, and it's a pretty old lineage, right? So it's like, if you're making a claim about who your parents were 400 years ago, right? You can be French based on a thousand years ago. So why, so what, what they're really saying is we're a different race and our race has been uniquely harmed. But because we have such a mix, uh, mixed up conception of race, we're sort of stuck on, on race as it was, right? So I mean, I'm, I'm not in favor of them necessarily saying that, but, I'm, but it's, in our current conception of race, that would be, be more accurate, right? For them to say, yeah, like we're the race of people whose, whose parents and grandparents, this happened to them. It's like, okay, like, you know, you're saying something about your ancestors, which is a racial claim. But they're saying, no, this is a lineage claim, not a racial claim. Well, what's the difference, right? That's the same thing. But in America, it's not, right? Like if it's a lineage claim, if it's not tied to phenotype as well, it's not a racial claim. And if it's a phenotypic claim, it is not also tied to like lineage, then it's, it's, not, it's not a racial claim. And that, that's just a, a sort of incredibly strange way to, to, to think about yourself, right? I, I, um, I could use a little more expounding on this because I, I think I'm following, but I'm not sure. So um, I guess based on the analogy that you just sort of gave, it's making me think of how some people of Jewish descent view themselves, view being Jewish as a, as a race, right? Um, I think that's right. So as what you're saying in terms of ADOS, are, are you saying that, are you saying that it's not racial or it's not viewed as, it's, they're not viewing themselves as a different so-called race primarily because they're still, although they're ADOS, they're still viewing themselves of the African race, which is like a whole bigger thing which doesn't yeah. include or does so that the being an american descendant of of enslaved people doesn't apply to every person who's racialized as black so in some ways by our own american logic it would make sense for ados to sort of um annex themselves from the category of uh, the traditional categories of race and basically proclaim that they're a different race, if that makes I'm sense. Saying, I'm saying their claim is as valid a racial claim as it is as any other claim is, right? They're claiming that like they're just as much a separate race as the French are a separate race from the Germans, right? The claim is, and I guess if you want to call French non-race, but I guess it's, an, it's a claim about their ethnicity at right. the very least, right? So it's, but, but, but it's not made like that. It's not received like that, right? Like their ethnicity is black, their race is black, but right. their parents and their grandparents and the great parents grandparents were the were were slaves in the U.S. Right. That makes it a that makes it and that's a claim about race, really, right? It's just as much of a claim about race as it is to be like you know from like uh, China or to be like a, a Jew or to be black or white, like the the. If those are claims about your ancestors, then ADOS is making a racial claim. Hmm. So this this makes me want to talk more about race and how you define it, because something you said earlier, you use the word subspecies. Um, and that's generally how I tend to think about race in a sort of scientific fashion, right? That the, the initial claim was that human beings were... Um, they were subspecies of human beings, which I 
take to mean something to the effect of, you know, there are homo sapiens and then there are these other people (laughs) who aren't quite homo sapiens. So they're not quite human. And hear me when I say this, um, everyone, if (laughs) hear me when I say this, when I say that racism masquerades itself as race, this is part of what I'm pointing to because the word race itself has meant other things and means other things even today but the context for which i'm talking about race i'm talking about it as it pertains to racism creating this meaning of race in the american context and i i i think of the early iterations of what race was after a certain number of generations of being in usage and i think about how you literally had people well-intentioned and not so well-intentioned um, making claims that there were subspecies of, of, of humans, which to me is essentially the same as saying there are humans and then there are not humans, which is how we then come to justify chattel slavery, right? Because you're literally saying that if you are Black, if you are Negroid, you are not human you're a beast you're an animal you are some you are an entity that can be owned right by these humans who are white and that's how the how racism comes to be masquerading itself as race in our society in the very early days and although you have abolitionists very prominent ones like frederick Douglass or harriet jacobs who come along and then have to make the the assertion of I'm black and I'm human, right? Because they are literally not viewed as human in this context. Um, There's a way in which we still find ourselves making such claims in 2021. Why? Because racism created race. That's what, that's how it's camouflaging itself. And so that we are still at a point centuries later of having to, to assert humanity into these various racial racialized groups. Um, so when I think of race and the meaning of race, and when I talk about how it doesn't exist, not in nature and not as a social construction, part of the my one of my primary claims in addition to identifying racism and race as the same thing is this, this fact of there not being subspecies of humans currently living on this earth, at least that I'm aware of. And if, if there are, it's not in the groups that we think that we think it is right. Yeah. So is that, is that the, is that the right way to look at? Yeah, no, and so, I mean, so that's exactly right. So I would say that species itself, right, is a really useful construct, but like everything in science, it's an arbitrary construct, right? Like I work with three, like when I was in, in uh, grad school, I worked on a project with three types of uh, fruit flies. And I'm just gonna call them A, B, and C because I actually forget the third one's name. So species A and B could have a fertile offspring, and species B and C could have fertile offspring, but species A and C could not. I think they only had infertile males, or I, I forget the exact, I think maybe B had fertile females and infertile males, but it doesn't really matter. The point is that you, you have these relationship scripts where A and B can have offspring that are fertile and so can B and C, but C and A can't, right? So if A and B are the same species, right? And A and B and C are the same species, then A and C must be the same species, but they're not right? But that's sort of a real edge case, right? That most of the time that doesn't occur. And that's sort of on the edge of subspecies, right? So it could have happened with humans, right? So, and and I think that was probably what they thought, right? And it's like, what's crazy is, you know, what we now think, yeah, we don't get it as wrong. Now we see a bunch of black guys like uh, that play basketball well, and we think, oh, that must be something, you know, inherent. And what they thought and, you know, because they behave different than the white guys who just shoot like three pointers. Right. And we think, oh, that must be like that. That's just, you know, something to do with, with being black or white. And I imagine, you know, you know, thousands of, of like years ago, people went to like a different continent and they saw people that were completely different than them. And they thought that must be inherent, but they thought it to a much higher degree. Right. So they thought that maybe they're like humans, you know, they had no idea. But, you know, if from a scientific perspective, in the like 
if you sort of like update what they thought, what they would have thought would have been that humans have existed, we're, we're an old species and we've existed for five million years. And these people have spent four, you know, 4.9 million years all together in Africa. And we've spent 4.9 million years in Europe all together. And now we just came across them. Or maybe we came across them 200 years ago, but 200 years is nothing compared to 5 million, right? And in that time, we can probably hardly even have offspring. Maybe we can kind of have them and maybe, you know, we'll have infertile sons and fertile females, which seems to happen a lot, you know, in biology, but like, we're sort of on the edge like yeah we're species so like subspecies is really not very like useful in science because for the most part it like it's basically an edge case it's like something that's almost a subspecies or something that's almost a different species but whatever we'll, we'll call them the same because they can sort of kind of breed that's it right and so they were they were just off on that they were just wrong right but it's you know we could we could have had you know subspecies if the if if our history had been different and technology would have not gotten so fast and the new world was like never discovered. And, you know, humans have had existed for another half a million years in like the old world and the new world completely, you know, with like no contact. then yeah, you would have had a, a speciation event. And before that you would have had a subspeciation event where fertility between the two groups was pretty marginal. Right. But that just didn't happen. Right. So so you're entirely right that there are no subspecies. So then people say, OK, well, I don't care. I don't care. My race is where my people have come from. And then it's like, OK, fine. You can try and do that. But you again, you have to pick a date and which date you pick isn't that. Mean. Now, now, I'll I'll concede. Right. Like picking where your parents were probably is less meaningful than picking where your parents were 500 years ago or a thousand years ago, because we definitely move around even more today. You know, we have airplane travel, and so, but the point is there's not a great time to pick. So when I say that like, that like Eidos is a race, I, it's not that I think they're a race, I'm saying that their claim is as much a racial claim as the French claim to be French or as any other one, because there isn't a time to pick. Like there isn't a time that that says, okay, if I choose this point in time, I know that my ancestors stayed put and stayed not connected to all the other people's ancestors for a long time. If there were, we, you know, it would we we would have a concept of subspecies that would that would that would have like a lot of meaning. But I think the thing is, humans are a really young species, and I think the thing that we discount in this is sort of my own inference, but looking at the genetic uh, data between humans, and it's it's when you get into the data, it's shocking, right? You see two Kenyan guys, and you look on like chromosome seventeen, and one of the Kenyans is has more genetic similarity to a guy from South Korea, and they're both Kenyan, right? And the only way that that can really happen is if humans migrate. Like our ancestors were incredibly migratory. And unfortunately, probably pretty genocidal, right? So like we would go places and then the people like in between would all get killed. So you have these people have one ancestry and these people have sort of similar ancestry, but there isn't someone in between. Now that can happen because of plane travel, right? So now you could be from Africa, you could fly to the US and say, oh, but my ancestry is still in Africa, right? And in the past we thought, oh no, like it was, there was a geographic matching to race and, you know, I think one big disservice that we did was we did this thing called the you know, PCA or like structure. And we found that there's a component, there's sort of a, a group of shared alleles that are, that exist mostly only in people that left Africa like 20,000 years ago. So basically like there's a prolific piece of the genome, but it's a small piece of the genome. But if you use that piece of the genome, you can separate uh, white and black people pretty well on principal component one. So that was sort of used as this push, to, oh shit, race is real. But I think that then when you look at the whole rest of the genome, you find more support for what I'm saying, which is that, you know, humans, like our ancestors, we don't know how they did it, but they certainly traveled. And so, I mean, some of this is fringe, but, you know, people think that maybe there were multiple trips to the new world, maybe, maybe somehow someone took a boat there. We know that the monkeys in the new world 
got there five million years ago and the continents were arranged as they were like like as they are now so it's just a big mystery like they must have floated across on a barge or something of wood right so like i think we maybe sometimes sell our ancestors short like they probably had like more technology than they lost it more technology than they lost it but we don't really know how and that's probably harder to figure out but from the genetics that we found they certainly moved a lot far more than we think this is fascinating. So what do you, what do you, what's the explanation for some of the, of the common misconceptions, um, some of which we've touched on a little bit, like, you know, people look at athletic ability or they look at intellectual ability or they look at, or they look at phenotype, right? And then they feel like, well, of course, race exists, not just in this social constructed way that some people might say, but in a very real, real <laughs> biological, it's in your DNA way. Like, how do you help me understand how observing those ideas about race and like the, the sort of um, misconceptions that get attached to race, how it's not actually race that's at work? I mean, the simple answer is it's culture, right? But I think it is important to like, when you add race to culture, culture becomes a lot stronger, right? When it's not just like, oh, like my ancestors and my family, we speak this language or like we make this like flavor of pie and our neighbors make the other flavor of pie, right? Like when, when you start to think like we, we make this flavor of pie, and we do it because it's who we are, right? And it's like who we are and it's like, it's inherent. Then it gets really strong, right? And it's like, we have so many counterexamples, but the fact that there's examples today of racial disparity or just racial proclivity, you know, in a bunch of different things makes people think, well, it must still be real. And it, it's just this famous game where, I mean, and also, I mean, confirmation bias is really, is really big in race because you can sort of cheat. Right. Like, I mean, Frankie Fredericks and uh, Wade Van Nierkirk are, you know, two of the greatest uh, sprinters of all time. And Frankie Fredericks is Namibian and Wade Van Nierkirk is um, South African. And it's actually sort of funny aside that his mother is Indian, but she wasn't allowed to run in South Africa because under apartheid, the coloreds couldn't run. And he's now the fastest 400 meter runner of all time. But people will say, oh, well, you know, the Bantu probably got down there. He's West African, right? And that's because people who are like really into track, they have noticed that East Africans, and really it's people from Kenya, are really good at the marathon. And I mean, the best miler of all time is North African, right? So they, they've noticed that different people in different parts of Africa are good at, at like different things. So they're not going to say, okay, like all Africans can sprint but they decided that all West Africans can sprint fast. And it's really because of Jamaica and like Trinidad. Like if you actually look at the enrichment, the enrichment in sprint performance is uh, West Indian. I mean, Jamaica has something like, I looked at the data the other day, like 20 something men to run under 10 seconds in the 100 meter. The US has like I don't know, 44 or something. So the US has like twice as many but the US is 150 times as large. I mean, there's a million people in Trinidad and six of them have run under 10 seconds in the 100. So there's massive enrichment. The people, and, and if you're gonna go by like ancestry, you know, the um, our last uh, world championship guy from Canada, Andre de Grasse, his parents are from Trinidad. And so if you start to uncover like all these guys from the US, around half of them, they their parents are you know either their parents or they were born there they're from somewhere in the west indies so the big enrichment is being west indian so if you're going to say like okay like i can't believe this isn't a genetic advantage you would harp on that you would say there must be something in the water you know you, I mean, which people do also say right but they're not taken seriously but when you say oh it must be something to do with being west african you're taken seriously because because because, because people take race seriously Right. It's, a, it, it's just a construct that we take seriously, but it's not the big enrichment. Like I was telling people in 2012, the Jamaicans swept the 200. And that's so incredible because there's 2 million people there. 
2 million, right? There's 300 million people in the US. There's 40, people, there's 40 million people here that are racialized as black. There's 2 million in Jamaica, right? There's 100 and what is it, 140 million in Nigeria. The Jamaicans went one, two, and three, and you're only allowed to put three guys in the race, right? So it's like, that shouldn't happen, right? That should be where we're, and some guy did actually. So there's actually a guy, he, he actually wrote a paper on it. He went to Jamaica and he like, like biopsied their legs and he looked for the gene for speed and he didn't find it, right? But as a whole, I saw, I mean, I guess there are some guys that take this kind of seriously, but the point is that's, that's not overall taken as a serious argument. What is, is what's their race, right? And that's, that's strange. And like the, the one that I just kind of, I happened upon today was I was reading something, some claim about race and it had to do with intellectual capability. And I looked at like outcomes and like uh, age efforts, birth and all these things, right? And I said, you know, white Americans are doing better than black Americans on this, but also, also Asian Americans are doing the best and native Americans are doing the worst. But from a racial perspective, right, those are the two most similar groups. It would be the Native Americans and the Asian Americans. So they're top and bottom of your list. So how, like, how can that be, right? If, it's, if shared ancestry predicts your performance, then, then the two groups that share the most ancestry can't bookend the list, right? But of course, people just don't care about that, right? So there's, there's enough counterexamples and more important than the counterexamples is that we have so many examples of stronger enrichment and the last thing i'll say is there are there are to be fair because i i think i don't want to be an ideologue here is to be fair is yeah there are differences among groups of people right and so for example the maasai are really tall so are the dinka right the the imbuti in uh congo are really short right that that's true so yeah, they probably wouldn't have the same success in the NBA as the Maasai, like that's true. And I'm not a, an expert on long distance running. Uh, so part of this comes from the fact that I'm ignorant, but I think I'm more convinced by arguments that, um, that, that uh, Kenyan uh, advantages in the marathon have a, a, a genetic component that I am convinced by arguments that they do in the sprints and partially it's just because being a sprinter my whole life and seeing i mean when i was in college a guy uh trended holiday was beating everybody the kids five five and it's, i couldn't couldn't even you know come close to him and he was so quick right and it just seemed like oh, i'm just too tall i can't do this for it and then like a year later usain bolt came and i was like oh okay i should be taller right and so the body types and sprinting, the diversity in the amount of ways to do it, it's harder to imagine that there's sort of one group that has a monopoly on it, right? So, so that's so when you when when it comes to race, I would say the more complex the characteristic is, the less likely that your claim is going to be true, right? So something like height, sure. Something like um, maybe something like I, I would go so far as maybe something like cycling or long distance running when it's just sort of you know people had quick acclimation to living at a high altitude that might give them an advantage. But I mean, I know running is looked at as very primal, but it's actually, I mean, you know, I do have a bias here, but I th it's one of the more complex, most amazing things that you can do, right? Like to run is actually not simple at all. So when, when things get complex, you're not going to see a, a big advantage that that one group has over, over a different group, because there's more than one way to achieve it. Right. So why would they have a dominance in all the genes for all the possible pathways for success along, you know, like like that metric. Right. So when you talk about enrichment, is that the same as talking about um, culture? And in, in one video that you shared recently, I'm forgetting who the speaker was, but the the sentiment was. The more you, you're good, you're you're better at what you do the most. It was something yeah. to that effect. Um, so when you talk about enrichment, are you talking about a sort of nature versus nurture type? Enrichment of is just my way of saying like the, there's an enrichment in, in Jamaicans at, at uh, when you look at sprint performances, there's too many, right? There shouldn't be that many because there's only 2 million people there and there's 300 million people here. 
So they should win, you know, uh, one out of every 150 uh, competitions. If they win more than that, they're enriched. Oh, okay, got it. Yeah, and so, and so the argument here, right, is of course, enrichment never proves causality, right? But the bigger the enrichment is, the more we start to think it's causal, right? So there's an enrichment in fast sprint times between men and women. Men are enriched at the top, right? That, that doesn't prove that men run faster, right? So the, in, in genetics, especially, right, that's some evidence that they may, right? And then you have to do functional, you know, work. So you find the genes or you find the hormones or you find the difference and you can prove it in an animal model or human models. Like, so for example, you can find a, you can take a testosterone, like, like measurement, find, okay, men have more testosterone. Then you can give females testosterone. Then if they run faster, then now you have a causal claim, right? So enrichment is usually present if there's something causal, but by itself, it doesn't prove causation. So I don't know. I don't think Jamaicans have a genetic enrichment in speed, but they, I, you can't deny that they have an enrichment in performance, right? So, and there's tons, tons of, you know, there's a bunch of examples of this, you know, across all kinds of things. But yeah, the more you do something, the better you get at it. Like that's true. And Jamaicans sprint much more. And I think it's also underrated, right? But the more you believe something, the better you are at it. Oh, yes. That, yes, that brings us sort of 360 back to how this conversation started. You were talking about how um, if one believes that they can't, you know, jump as high because of their so-called race, or if one believes that they can't excel in math because of their so-called race, what you name it, whatever right. a person believes that it does, of course, have an impact for better, or for worse on their ability to do the thing that they believe they can, or if they believe they can't. Um, so I want to talk about that a little bit, because I know we had um, on the table the idea of talking about um, Johnny Otis and his conception of race in a sort of um, what you think might be a healthier, a healthier constructionist conception of race. And it strikes me that it's relevant to the discourse or the idea that what a person believes is going to influence, maybe not determine, but will certainly influence um, how they move in the world, how they are in the world, right? Um, and I think that because of the contemporary debate around the thing being called CRT and what's happening in education, you hear a lot of um, detractors of what's being called CRT saying things like, I don't want my racialized black daughter to be taught that the ceiling is lower for her because she's female and because she's racialized as black. I don't want that idea to be planted in, in my child's head. Um, and so it strikes me that that's, that's sort of, for me, the underlying current of, of why talking about all this and really drilling down is, is significant. Um, so let's talk more about, we've spoken a bit about what, how we think um, race is conceived of or how it has been conceived, how it's shape-shifted, how it is in yeah. the American context compared to other contexts. What do you think a, a healthier way of viewing that same thing might be? Well, there's a difference between healthy and accurate and useful. That's one thing. Mm. So my issue with you, I guess, yeah, I guess we should, we should say what's being called CRT or the 1619 Project is... A lot of people, they attack it and they say, it's not true. They say, it's, it's, and it's like, honestly, when it comes to kids, I mean, who cares if it's true to some extent, right? Like I have kids remember anything, you know, like I, and I was exposed to sort of a different sort of uh, like set of like educational ideas when I was young and they weren't true. But what, what I don't like about the, I mean, I don't I'm not, I'm not an expert in this at all, but from the little I've read, what, what I don't see is that whether it's true or not, I don't see it as useful. And I was sort of exposed to an like Afrocentric conception where we were told that like the Egyptians were black and they're from Africa. And I was in the, the great 
was from Africa, so he was black somehow. And a lot of that stuff wasn't true, but it was really about like, wow, that like pretty much everyone who's ever done anything good in the world is black. And it's like, okay, I, like I can see how like telling a kid that is like pretty dope. It's like shit, like, you know, I can be whatever I want to be. And like, there's all these people and pretty much all the, the good stuff was done by black people. And what I see now when I see what's called CRT is it's more about talking about what the white people did, like, right? It, and it's, so I just don't see it as, you know, I'm not an expert on like education, but just from the little I've seen, it doesn't seem as useful when it comes to like how it's going to like make those kids more successful because it, and, and maybe it's a masculine feminine argument, but just from the kids I've taught, especially the younger kids, that's not going to inspire them, right? Like they kind of would rather hear something that's you know, like inspirational about how great they are and about power basically, right? And I don't think it's really that empowering to learn about just how bad slavery was or just how into slavery the white people were. You know, whether it's true or not, it's not so important really. And so I think, you know, race isn't a very useful idea, but if it's going to be, if kids are going to be racialized, then they should be racialized to think that like that, that this makes them, you know, in, like really like the best. Right. But yeah, but I, but, but I still think, yeah, long, like the, in the long run, yeah, we should not have kids be racialized. Like that should be the goal. And if we're going to have it be, be something, it should be a, a cultural conception because then, right. Then, you know, it's not, it, it, it's something that that you can take and you can leave and you, know, you can take parts of it. You can leave parts of it. You can join a different culture and, you know, like you can learn a new language and be that if you want. Right. So I think that's, if we're going to have racialized, if we're going to, if we're going to think race is culture, fine, but make sure it's really culture. Right. And don't cheat on that because that's, that that's the problem. You're going to cheat. And, you know, and so I, if you could leave it as culture, then sure. It's like, that's the like music you like, the stories you're told, you know, the the type of church that you go to. And that, that's probably the most real part that there is. But keep it something that's, you know, the positive parts of being from a group of people. OK, yeah, I, I definitely see why you um, referenced Johnny Otis uh, before, because um, for folks who might be unfamiliar, do a quick Google search, you will find a wealth of information on him. But my cursory search was, I discovered, I think he was um, of Greek heritage um, and racialized as white in the United States. And from a very early age, loved what's called black culture, just loved it. And then he became this really prolific R&B artist, um, singer, and it, I was reading one piece on him before um, this conversation, and the person spoke about how um, when they first came in contact with one of Johnny's songs, the, the, one of the first thoughts they had was, because they, they heard the song, they thought a particular thing had a particular image in their mind, but then they discovered that he's white and he was like, that's the blackest sounding white guy I've ever heard. And then that prompted the author of this essay to examine the, the illogic of, of that kind of, that's kind of thinking <laughs> and way of, of viewing oneself and other people. Yeah. Um, and, um, and so in part of the appreciation for the essay that I was re reading, it was like, Johnny just, he, he never questioned it. He didn't look at it as I am not racially black, so I can't participate in culture in this meaningful way. And from all accounts, it seems like the audience, the American audience received him with open arms in this genre that's, that's typically associated with racialized black people. Um, I would say I would say he went farther. I mean, he has a line that I mean, and so I think it's a little different. He wasn't just a guy that fell in love with black culture like online. He I think he immigrated like when he was really young or his parents moved. And I think he came in um, in Oakland. So he was like in a you know black neighborhood and he loved like the music. So he got really into, into like, like into that as a kid. Like, like he married a black lady like he just 
And he has a line where he's like, you know, I, I realized in like 1960s America, you can either be white or black. And I was just going to be black. You know, like, so he he did sort of, he wasn't a white guy doing R&B. He was a black guy who, it was like, uh, you had to really know the music to know that, oh, guess what? You know, that guy's actually white, right? Like, right. If, like most people probably thought he was just a, a black guy that looked white. And again, right. maybe he was because that doesn't really mean anything, right? Like you don't know about his Greek ancestors. Like I, like we talked about, like sickle cell is is really high in Greece, but not Italy, right? So like we don't know his ancestry, but right. But I mean, probably, yes, his parents were like immigrants from, from Greece. So certainly he probably wasn't an ADOS race. Like he, like he wasn't of that race, but people probably just thought he was, right? Mm-hmm. And it's just interesting because to compare him to like Rachel uh, Dolezal and to just look at how those are looked at really different. And there's actually been a rash of like Rachel uh, Dolezal. There's been like multiple stories right. and it is different because she tried to sort of join the black, like, like bourgeois class. And he joined, he joined like as a kid in Oakland and he joined something that, and you know, at that time, the way race was in America, like a white guy that wanted to do that, like his authentic, it would never it would never be at all questioned like because why would you want to do that if it wasn't sincere like why would you want to be black when you can be white you know like you must be sincere whereas when she did it it was a different time i think it's interesting how we look at race today how like now that's totally unacceptable well i think there i think the um a difference that is worth noting is that even in your telling of of Johnny's story, when he says, I'm, I'm black, um, I understand him to be saying something about culture and his cultural, you know, affiliation. He's not saying he's racially black. And so people will then contend with the fact that Dozo says I'm black and lies about her ancestry to do that. Right. I think she, I think the story was her dad is black. And so that, that in large part is what I hear people contending with is the fact that she tried to, it's this idea of the metaphorical blood, right? She, she tried to change her race biologically through the body. Um, And uh, it, she's a figure that I like to, to think about and examine and, and talk with people about, because on the one hand, and I know this resonates with you because you said something similar earlier, On the one hand, people who identify themselves as constructionists, meaning they say outright race is a construction, will then um, treat race as if it is of nature, as if it is something inherent, as if it is something that that a person is born with and something that can't be changed and is not fluid. And as if it is also something that then dictates or determines what your culture is. So nowadays it strikes me that one cannot number one, one cannot decide that their race is something else. Although there's this whole idea of transracial. I don't know if you've gone down that rabbit hole, but there it's this whole thing. Um, Wait, that's uh, a real thing. Like, like it's a real thing. Oh my goodness. I'll share stuff with you afterward. Um, and, and, but generally speaking, people can't decide that they're racially something else because that's how fixed of an idea we have about race. But then also there's a way in which even, even when we just talk about culture as it's attached to the idea of race, now we have all this talk about cultural appropriation. We have this, this sense of culture belonging to racial groups. Yeah, exactly. So that shouldn't that make you sympathetic because Johnny Otis didn't have to lie about his father because the people he was with didn't require that. And because he was, you know, a, he was in like the, like R and B scene in Oakland and he was famous there, but he didn't have a, someone from the New York times writing this like scathing critique about how he's appropriating culture. Right. You didn't have to think about that. Maybe if he was alive today, he'd be like, shit, I better invent a backstory because otherwise someone's going to get mad. But then right. I think about, but then I think about Elvis and the um, the points of contention people had with him in terms of of I think they would make claims of the the claim was culture appropriation. I think about the countless racialized black people who have consistently since you know since forever complete exaggeration, but since uh, let's say 
post-emancipation, right, yeah. have been accused of trying to be white or wanting to be white, not just racially, but also because that's conflated with culture, it's conflated with all the things culturally, and it's not, it's usually not intended as a compliment, it's usually intended as something else, yeah. and so nowadays, the picture from you know, 19, the 1960s doesn't strike me as, as completely dissonant with um, the picture and the landscape of how it continues to operate nefariously today, such that people are, people, more people than not are still wed to the conception of race as being um, both um, in our DNA and also about ancestry and it's also meant to be conflated with what culture is and ethnicity it's conflated with all the things and it this also makes me think of something you said earlier when you were talking about um how people generally speaking they tend to go you know kind of as 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 far back as they can conceive to identify what their race is as opposed to looking at you know their parents or their grandparents are just like closer right in terms of generations and it strikes me that part of part of my contention with constructionism and part of my sincere observation and assertion that constructionism doesn't get us to the end goal of eliminativism which is i think something you and i shared based on what you said earlier, which is that um, you think that we should get to a place when when children aren't racialized at all, right? I think I think the goal is to make it like astrology, though. That's not quite elimination, but I'm I'm fine with that. That's a fine endpoint for me. Well, yeah, because so so here's the thing, and this is the first time you and I are hashing this part out, right? Yeah. So there are six philosophies of race and each of us holds two philosophies. One speaks to what we think race is and one speaks to what we think should be done with race. Yeah. So when I hear your astrology um, analogy, which I'll invite you to, to share more and explain, I look at that as how you think race um, should be operating. But I look at, I look well, at it also as compromise. how compromise. It's like, there's always going to be something like you say, I'm in a, What's it, eliminativist? Yes. Sure, sure, but you're never going to eliminate anything. So I want to, like, 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 push it and, like, I want to, like, to, like, to push race into that level of respect in the discourse, right? Like, it will be, like, like, put over there so that, you know, like, if you were having a serious intellectual debate and you were like, yeah, but, you know, he's a Virgo, people would be like, okay what the hell right if you're saying like, how can you say that to me as a capricorn right it's like okay you can't say that right and so that's a like that's a state that if race exists there it's eliminated enough right you, you you we have to decide what is elimination it can't be that nobody believes in it right you know there's always going to be somebody that believes in like in like every little thing so yeah to me that is elimination like that's as good as you can ask for and that's actually a, a, a good way to conceive of it if you want to be and if you want to be someone who wants to like to to do that i think in your head because like we talked about it's hard if you say i don't believe in race and then you make a comment in, on race because people find that that makes you insincere I right? say so I don't believe that race exists, and then you say like people were really excited that black that 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 Barack Obama was the first black president, and they say yeah, but you don't believe in race, so you can't say that. Well, that's obviously silly, right? So I think that what you can say is race to me exists just like horoscopes exist. I know they exist. I know you guys believe in one. I even know that I've been assigned a, a horoscope, but. I don't believe in it. I don't believe in astrology. And I won't take you seriously if you try to tell me that someone acts a certain way because they were born in a certain month. Like it's funny, but I'm not gonna, I'm, I mean, that's it, right? So I think that is, that is my example of what elimination looks like. Yeah, well, I, it's interesting to me because um, it, part of what you said there is like to, if we if we think of it in terms of zodiac signs, um, so it's this sort of, acknowledgement that okay the zodiac signs exist but i don't attach any significance or you know overarching meaning to 
It's complete. Being nonsense. a Gemini, I'm a Gemini, yeah. so you can imagine yeah. the insults that I receive as a Gemini. Yeah. Um, and my wife is a Libra, and so she yeah. gets all kinds of stuff. And sometimes I crack jokes about her Libraness, so, yeah. right? Um, but but this is where we differentiate because whereas you you kind of have this constructionist view of race. If, from what I'm hearing, and you are more or less satisfied with reconstructing the meaning of race as it operates now into the the analogy of of like a zodiac sign, right? Well, and I think I that want, I think I know, that, I that makes that. sense. I want to like relegate the people who are interested in race to the same place that we put people who are really interested in their zodiac signs. No, yeah, I think That's that I th- yeah. I think that makes sense, but this is um, a key differentiation for me. So I say that race doesn't exist, period. And some people don't, I feel like more people than not miss what the differentiation is between a constructionist and a skeptic, because as a constructionist, I might say race doesn't exist, but it still rendered real in real ways, right? Ways, right? Because people believe in it. And so people racialize me. And so as a consequence of that racialization, I might experience discrimination or whatever. Where I sit is it's not in nature. So it doesn't exist biologically and it doesn't exist as a social construction because the thing that people point to and say that's race or that is racial It's any of the other number of things that have come out through the course of this conversation. It's racism masquerading itself as race or it's ethnicity, which I think includes the DNA and the biology and the ancestry, all the things, or it's cultural, which is part of ethnicity. It's, it's all of the, it's basically everything except what it's being presumed to actually be what it's being called. So in that way, for me, the race doesn't exist, racism does, because for me, it's the same exact thing. And helping people stop conflating the idea of race with ethnicity and culture and the, uh, these other meaningful things that do have a lot of a lot of significance and meaning to human society um, is part of my work as a, what's called a skeptic, because ultimately, as a skeptic, the thing that I'm working to eliminate then is not race. So it's not a matter of reconstructing race to be a sort of zodiac sign or anything. To me, that wouldn't make sense because then I would be saying as a skeptic, I believe in the idea of reconstructing racism, which I don't because I think that eliminating racism is the ultimate goal. But, you know, not for nothing, I didn't create the language for the philosophies. So I don't actually believe that we can get 100% of human beings to agree on really anything, much less this thing of, of racism, right? So I don't believe that we can eliminate it 100%, but I think we can, I think we're closer to the statistical majority than not. And I think that we can get to the statistical majority. And I do think over a couple of you know, four or five generations, we could get to the point where it's not a thing at all. But I will say part of, um, part of my interest in, um, our, part of our mutual interest in like working together and learning from each other is this, is this desire to eliminate the violence that we both see that is attached to race, right? And how race operates in American society, at least. And so uh, in that respect, we're definitely aligned. And it's just a matter of figuring out how do we get there. And one reason why I do this work and have these conversations is I think that the, 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 the average person as a self-proclaimed constructionist still mistakes, as you said earlier, what race is or, or the significance. And there's all these kinds of misconceptions that come along with the idea of race. And that for me is why we're unable to actually get to the point of the astrology metaphor or to my sort of (laughs) idyllic world of eliminating the thing altogether, because constructionists are still tangled up in naturalist philosophies of race, which then mean that we're unintentionally upholding the same hierarchy that we're trying to dismantle. So for me, your your constructionism makes perfect sense. It's refreshing. I'm like, 
yes, Tade, like I am, I am here for that. Like I, I believe you, I agree with you. And that's how I would see race if it didn't operate as racism, as, as I'm saying. And, and I would love if other people saw it in that sort of astrological sense. Right. But for the average person, they say one thing, but then they do what you said is a pain point for you too, which is like, it's a made up thing, but then, oh, it means so much to me, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and that to me, that is where skepticism, I think can help people, um, can help people toward either of our goals, which I would be perfectly satisfied if the astrology thing happens for race. Amen. I'm, I would not. Also, it's also interesting, right? Because our fight, and it's mostly people like us, right? It's like professors, it's this elite class of people. Like when you're fighting against racism, it's almost like why? So, I mean, there was a, there was a football guy that he's some announcer and he had this idea that black people ran faster because of slavery or something. He said that. And he got fired, right? I mean, it was like terrible. You can't say that. That's racist. That's really bad. But like when I first moved to LA, I remember I was looking for a place to live. And this is so to say that like astrology could be bad, right? There, there was a sign, or, you know, there was an ad and it said, sorry, no Sagittarius. I mean, right, I'm is not that a Sagittarius. Serious Sagitt- thing? It was, I was looking for a roommate. I was looking for like a, a place to live. But there was a rule that you can't be a Sagittarius if you're, you're going to live here, right? What? Yeah, I mean, that. <laughs> That's LA. That's a, that's definitely, I mean, if you're in LA, like they, they take it very seriously. Right. So, but I didn't think, I, I didn't think, Oh, thankfully I'm not a Sagittarius. I also didn't think what a horrible person this person is to discriminate against. I just thought, wow, this person is, is like, this person is insane. Right. Like that's all I thought. Right. And so when somebody says something about race, they share some idea. It's like, that's, I think where, like, if you want to, you want race to go away, you can't think what a terrible human you have. You have to think this person's insane, right? Like that's sort of, so that's why I say like, what's our model going to be? Because if you're going to, if you're going to fight somebody for saying something about race, then you're not really, you're not really eliminating it, right? If, if, if that's the worst thing that you can do is cross this line or say this thing that, that you don't want to do or that you don't want someone to say, then it's not eliminated. It's very real, right? You're making it real. And I just remember I took a friend to play football one time and he was horrified because he was like, Oh, that white person saying the N word. And it was like, yeah, you know, this person was probably like, like Puerto Rican or something, but it was just like, nobody cared because everybody, you know, a bunch of people, you know, like, like in the Bronx, they play football and they all talk the same. And it's like, in some ways, like they're more post-racial than our elite class of people who observe them and then make the rules. Right. So in some ways, people have already eliminated away race in some small subgroups. But the people in charge, and I think the intelligentsia is they are the ones who who decide what the rules are. And I think they, they don't decide the sort of natural rules that people do when they just get along. Right. And so I think that in some ways it's 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 on us. It's on people, you know, who teach. It's on those kind of people to stop to to stop making things worse and i think in a lot of ways intellectual people in this country have made have made race worse because their conception of it doesn't match people's experience at all yes i would agree they made racism worse and um that's actually the genesis of my dissertation turned forthcoming book was my observation that within african-american literary studies specifically African-American literary scholars were unintentionally upholding the problem of racism. And it was largely because of how they talk about and treat and naturalize race. Um, And, you know, it's interesting because part of, part of my efforts center around sharing the philosophies of race, sharing the alternative philosophies of race, like skepticism, which is something I try to highlight, but also encouraging people not to get stuck in the skeptical aspect of theory of racistness, because the second philosophy that I, that I hold, um, that racistness speaks to is eliminativism as a goal, is racistness as a goal then, right? So maybe we don't agree that people are currently raceless, because I identify myself as a constructionist or something of that nature, but 
that doesn't preclude us from agreeing that the end goal should be along the lines of eliminativism, right? Yeah. And I think that uh, I look forward to the day when I have to do less what I call race translating, which is, you know, when I see race being referenced on media or in a conversation or in a classroom or in a book, whatever, trying to figure out what is this person trying to signal to me with this? Is it culture? Is it uh, is it positions of power? So is it is it having to do with racism? What is going on here? Let me translate it into language that is more um, real, which people <laughs> might cringe when I say real. I don't have a better word for it right now. Um, and ultimately recognizing that because people in academia do have such an impact on society, and this has been true across time, right? That I view it as my responsibility to be unabashedly vocal about my observations, about my ideas, about educating people on these other philosophies with the hope that sooner than later, I won't have to be talking about the same kind of things anymore. You know, yeah. um, it's really unfortunate because I think one thing that, sort of tied us together is the current climate and what we see happening in American society, this sort of um, the tension that I think, I can't say that it's worse than any other time, but people perceive racism as being worse than, than at any other time, which is kind of fascinating if you look at the polls and the data that's coming around that. And part of the ways that that upholds the problem, at least to my own um, perspective, it, it goes to something we're talking about off camera, which is, which is all these different statistics that people might point to and say, look, this is evidence of, um, they'll call it a racial disparity, right? So they'll say, this is evidence of systemic racism, or they'll say, this is evidence of racial inferiority or racial superiority. Um, they'll spin it in some type of way, tying it to, to race in the problem of racism. And, um, and I think in that way, make the problem infinitely more worse than what it really is, because then we're not properly naming the problems that, that ail us. And then that means we're not able to really solve those problems. Um, Oh, something that I wanted to circle back and ask you about in our first conversation, you mentioned that people in your field, generally speaking, all seem to concede the fact that race is a non thing, but then in some ways still insist on doing research around race. Mm -hmm. um, I would love to hear more about that. And like, why do you think that that is, how do you think that that impacts your field and how do you think that impacts our does it does it hinder our ability to sort of I crack certain codes incredibly destructive if the scientists once it gets to science i mean also i mean i'm a scientist maybe um there's some bias there but once it gets it bleeds into there it's like if if we're if we also make the same contradiction because you know i guess i give the social scientists the pass because maybe they don't understand the falseness of race so they say it because it sounds nice but they don't really believe it but if the scientists are making the same mistake right if a geneticist is saying like well um i want to solve this problem but i need to hear from some more black geneticists about what they think if he's doing that right then then it's like then I, to me, it just looks like if you're a lay person, then you know he's that's BS, right? You know that like everything he's saying doesn't make sense. And so, like, I mean, there was there was a doctor that had this big push, and it was for the vaccine rollout. He was like, we have to. He was like, because of vaccine hesitancy and because of the Tuskegee experiment, we gotta get black people. We gotta push the, the vaccine on them first. And it's like, okay, man, like, just come on. Like logically, if these people are like very skeptical and then you're like, hey, you guys first, like, like that's just, that's just, a, but I, I think you, when, when people, I mean, he, he happened to be white, but I think especially for, I mean, to be honest, especially for white people, when, when they start talking about race, they, they just say stupid stuff. 
And because as and, and I think it's because there it's so fraught that it's um there's just so many rules about it that they're trying to navigate and say the the right thing. I think it just makes it us all much, much stupider. Right. Like it just, and so that's, and it's not good for the people who are supposed to be smart, the scientists to sound stupid. I think, I think it's just not good, right. For society to have that, like someone's supposed to sound smart. Right. And the social scientists can, they can spin it as they sound radical. Right. But scientists can't do that. So they just sound silly. Right. They just sound because like regular people can be like, why would you do that? You know, like, why would you have this idea that that doesn't seem like it would work? And it's because I think like the dumbest stuff I hear my colleagues say is when they talk about racial equity or like, you know, like I'm in Brooklyn and, you know, this is an underserved community and, I'm a, you know, and yeah, sure, of course, we should do more stuff for people in Brooklyn, maybe people in Flatbush. But like instead people have to they call it black and brown it's like okay everyone here is like jamaican uh, then, then i'm black and brown there's black but like they're jamaican like maybe just say like how about the jamaican people in flatbush or how about the people in flatbush but they're like it's a black and brown it's like why say that right and they sound silly saying that and it's it's silly because it's actually like inaccurate right because when, when, when you're really concerned with saying the right thing like black and brown not just black and you say that about Flatbush, which isn't black and brown, right? And it's wrong. People can hear that. And you you sound you sound kind of like a fool, right? So a lot of times they sound silly. And, I, and that's my my biggest like thing. And then they don't know what to focus on. And also I would say some of my my anger is to people, you know, people of color in my field as well. And 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 I think that's just it's hard to solve that problem, but it's because there's a utility to being a racialized person once you've sort of rose up in the game. And I think that's one of the more sort of unfortunate things. I remember I was talking to somebody about this and my belief is sort of that blackness can be a, an advantage if you're sort of on the bottom or on the top of society. And, but most people are in the middle, right? And I, I said that because I was at USC at the time and I did, my friend had just got robbed and I, you know, and he was like, well, you wouldn't get robbed because like, you know, the kids, you know, and, you know, and I was like, yeah, yeah okay. Like, I, I can see how maybe you would rather be black or Hispanic if you're, if you're going to walk, like walk to the bus in some of these neighborhoods, because you don't look like as, as much of, of a target. I can also see how if you're trying to become like vice president, how that could be an advantage. Right. And so that's the problem is you have these people sort of spinning up that themselves rather than talking about other people. And I think that's also a big cultural shift. Like Muhammad Ali is a hero of mine. And like if you look at everything he said, I mean, he was definitely believed in race far more than I think we should. But everything he said was about helping the brother in rat infested housing. And it was never about himself. He was like, I'm rich. I'm good. Right. Like he was he, he was fine. Right. And he dealt with way more discrimination than people do now. But he like, he realized that like, if everyone had Muhammad Ali money, like his people would be saved, right? So it's like, if you have it, you can't be. And so I think that's a small problem, but I think it's not even the major problem. The major problem is that you have people trying to talk about race in the correct way. They're also defining what the correct way is those rules are often changing because there's an incredible, a incredible amount of like, like trepidation about it. And it's in, becoming increasingly divorced from, I think the views of most people like, and I just wanted to add that, like, I, I don't know anything about trans racialism as like an academic topic, but just growing up and I remember like I was running in the Bahamas and I met a transracial guy there whose name was, um, was Milky. And he was like a white Bahamian. He had like the accent and like everything. And everyone just kind of accepted him. And I think that like there's more transracials than people probably realize, but just like some white guy in the hood whose name probably has white in front of it. He's, he's called like White Mike or something. And like that actually happens, right? It never happens in like academia, right? There's no transracials in academia, but like, well, that, that are accepted. Like they get caught, right? But I think like, in some ways, like we move slower than real people move, right? Because we're so, we're so, we're so afraid of it. Yeah. So the transracial thing, I'll, I'll put you up on game. Um, 
Uh, so it has actually been taken by people outside of, of academia. I think in academia, transracial might have meant something along the lines of what you just described, actually. This this sort of transcending in a lot of ways yeah. of how people think about race. But in, uh, you know, outside of the ivory towers, it has co- come to mean something more closely to transgenderism. And in that way, there are people who are having surgeries. Like the the most infamous really? um, oh, figure I can that. think of is Ali London. Yeah, yes, I'll send you, I'll send you the name later. Oh, Ali London. If, if you look them up on look them up on YouTube, they this is this is the part that I was like pointing to the sort of nonsensicalness of of race and how people view it, um, but they did a coming out video where they they announced their pronouns and they announced their race and the pronouns are the race was korean and the um they had had 18 surgeries up to that point plastic wait, surgery what are your race pronouns yeah you don't got race pronouns this is the confounding thing it was like jimmy and it was like a Korean name or Korean word and then pronouns they, them, non-binary. But in uh-huh. their pronoun explanation, they were like, my pronouns are they, them, Jimmy and Korean. That was the, and people were like, what is that? How is that? <laughs> what is that? Who, what, where, and how, why? People yeah. were confounded just as you are. Uh, but they were very serious and they they had 18 plastic surgeries, Tade, to oh, look so Korean. Sad to look yeah. Korean and then they call themselves transracial. And there are other examples that I could point to. And fortunately, I don't think this happens a lot. I think this is a very small statistical minority of people, but there are people who, who are uh, promoting this, this way of viewing race, which I think is so like, it's just so nefarious for all of the reasons I'm sure I've made very clear they're saying that this is a good thing because they feel this way that like they that feel they grand, so they, they should be allowed to do this yeah that it's essentially you know yeah. i was born in the wrong i was born in the wrong race and um i i've never felt more beautiful i've never been happy with myself in terms of how i looked or feeling like i belonged i want people to take me seriously as a korean you name it like just going down that entire um they're looking like bro. uh john b or like i forget that one guy with who was who he was with oh i girl. love john b the guy that was with that girl paula something i forget his name but like all the white boys that like become like r&b singers they get so much love so like the, the last thing that you want to do if you're born in the wrong body is switch right like like you should like run with like that like like novelty right like it's if, if if you're good at it be something else but like it seems like that's a big disadvantage it's so it's right? that, like you do better not being the one that you're in. Like people traditionally seem to do better at it. Right. It's so it's I mean, you're asking me to help you make logic out of what's <laughs> yeah, okay. illogical. Um, but yeah, it, this is an entire thing. There are um, there was this one woman who basically became you know, famous or at least very well known because she had some kind of procedure to so it couldn't have been a procedure to, to make m- increase the melanin in her skin, but it was it was something that made her skin go from very, 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 very pale to very, 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 very dark. And then she had like all oh, of these that's other. A, there's a drug like for melanin darkening. Oh, it is that. OK. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's um, pretty, yeah. Yeah. Australia, yeah. they have a clinical trial for it because of all the sunburns, actually. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, but to the, to the, you know, to the umpteenth degree, then had all these plastic surgeries and then had something, something to, um, probably some type of perm or something to like texturize her hair. But I think she was trying to make it so it was permanent. It was this whole thing, trying to, trying to turn from white to black. Right. And yeah. there are fictional accounts of th- this sort of thing happening. Um, and people exploring what would a world look like in which a person could physically change their race. Um, but yeah, that's, it. it's, it's perhaps most fascinating because that 
originated outside of academia. That's like on the ground. This is yeah. how people are conceiving of race. And then they're, then they feel compelled to go and do all the, this so what type stuff. Of, what type of conception is that? If that's a, like, what do you call that? I think that's a, um, that's reflective of a naturalist conception of race, certainly because they're attaching phenotype to what it is to be racialized a particular way in a really, you know, racist um, way but, of viewing. But they were already like, I, would they argue that they're just matching who they really are? Well, that would be their argument, but who you really are, the idea of being born in the wrong body then is this, if, if we look at if we look at transgenderism, the idea is then that one's biological sex isn't matching. Um, I'm sorry, that one's, well, yeah, it's that one's biological sex isn't ma- matching one's, I can't even say gender because that doesn't really work because there well, are some, I mean, whatever the word is, there's like a true sex and then there's right. like an outward appearance. Right. There's, there's incongruous that they're not they're incongruous, right? So right. Like, and yeah. so then they then they take medical means and surgeries and things like that to make their body somehow match how they think they were. This true to race, born. right? This true race for them is neither ancestral nor phenotypic. But it is phenotypic. No, no, because no, no, because they're changing their pheno- they're changing their body to match their true race. So the true race existed. Right. Like, so if you were this person, you were Korean because you're Korean. Like, that's who you are. You happen to have the wrong parts or you don't, your face isn't Korean enough. But there, there, there's something else to them. Right. Oh, no. Um, because, well, at least Ali London, he's oh, so British. He wasn't born Korean. No. Inside. No, no. But like, on, like, does he think he was born Korean or did he decide to become Korean? No, he did. My understanding of him is that um, he decided to become oh. korean or maybe he was like well, then yeah that's extreme extreme naturalist then. I'm, I'm looking in the chat box to see if anyone knows who i'm talking about so that they can they can help me out okay. all i know about ali london for certain so that i don't misspeak is that um he's british he's a british internet personality and singer and they are most notable I'm sorry, I'm misspeaking pronouns. They are most notable for identifying as a transracial Korean for having multiple surgeries to attempt to look like Jimin, who is a member of uh, the K-pop group BTS. Uh, So that's where the Jimin thing comes in. So British, I don't know. I don't know anything else outside of that, but kind of like the Johnny Otis they were talking about. uh, The Wikipedia page says that they were interested in South Korean Korean culture beginning from a young age and then started um, exploring the culture and all those things, but then went and had surgery to look the part too, which is such a naturalist. It's like, imagine if race race wasn't conceived in the ways that that this person conceives of race, what would that participation in the culture look like? It would look probably a lot like Jimmy or Johnny, Johnny Otis, right? Like it would look, and I don't think that, I think that most people wouldn't bat an eye at that. Right. Um, I don't think, I think, I I think they would Mm -hmm. claims of cultural appropriation now, which is extremely problematic. Um, but so, Certainly, I, I think that more people than not would recognize the sort of egregiousness of I'm going to go have 18 surgeries to try to look yeah. like that, you know. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, yeah that is, it's it's I feel like we're we're deep in the trenches of the problem yeah. of racism and academia certainly influences what happens in, in the public sphere, certainly. Um, and, but I do think it is multi-directional because, of course, we know that academia, we don't operate in a vacuum, right? We, we come from the same communities that we that we participate in, that we tend to study and all of that. Um, well, some of us do. Some of us do. Yeah. And, and I think that that's I think that that's part of the part of the hindrance, because when you're in a thing, it can be that much more challenging to see the thing more clearly, if that makes sense. Oh, no, totally. uh, but I feel yeah. 
I feel heartened um, knowing yourself, knowing other folks yeah, like no, you. Good. Yeah, yeah, it's like it's there's there's not there's a few of us, you know, sneaking around hiding. You know, and it's <laughs> like, yeah, because it's like people are. I'm like, no, I really don't believe in that. They're like what? You know, and especially like like as a sprinter, people are always like, what? You don't live in that little? And I was like, no. <laughs> yeah it's, it's like being a heretic almost right it, it, it is crazy yeah. yeah yeah it is so john mcwarder are you fam- familiar with him yeah he's the guy at the new york times exactly yeah, yeah. yeah. and he just had his oh actually, yeah yeah he's like he's, he's at columbia yeah i know i know somebody who did a he worked who worked with him a linguist the guy named Francesca. yes yeah. exactly yes so his most recent book is something um titled something like woke Re- woke religion or something like that and he looks at what's dubbed wokeness or or being woke as a f- as a form of religion and so when you say it's we're kind of like heretical <laughs> in a sense um yeah i i agree because the the <laughs> I agree on the one hand because my consistent observations of how things things operate tell me that 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 is right. But I'm also pleasantly surprised and, and heartened by how my ideas have been almost surprisingly well received too by the vast majority of people. You know, I do have um, people who get hung up on the skeptical part, as I was saying earlier, but one needn't be a skeptic to be an eliminativist. Um, one could be a constructionist to be an eliminativist. My mentor at Howard University is. Shout out to Dr. Carter, uh, who I think is, is watching. <laughs> um, and so one needn't- But you don't have to be a skeptic to be an eliminativist? Exactly. So 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 Dr. Carter, okay, <laughs> so rewind. And why would you eliminate something that, that, that you might believe in? So six philosophies of race, three that speak to what a person think what a person thinks race is, three that speaks to what a person thinks should be done with race. Each of us holds two philosophies, even without having a name for it. So we've spoken about naturalism and constructionism and skepticism. And then the the three categories regarding what a person thinks should be done with race are eliminativism, conservationism, or reconstructionism. Now, Mm -hmm. conservationism, that's kind of, that's what it sounds like, right? Like one thinks that we should keep race. Probably you're going to be a naturalist. You're going to believe that race is biological. What else can you do with nature except keep it, right? Yeah. Um, In American society, I think we're taught, uh, programmed is a word I like to use, (laughs) I think we're programmed to be reconstructionists, um, constructionists, because we've constantly and persistently tried to and and actually had success with reconstructing how racism operates. And by racism, I mean race, how that operates. Um, Eliminativists argue for whatever reason, the concept of race should be eliminated. So usually if you're a constructionist eliminativist which would be a common a common position in terms of the constructionist part you believe that race is not biological it's rendered real in some meaningful way probably you recognize racism as creating race in the ways that i've named and for that reason you're going to say okay i concede that it's like um you know it's like believing in gemini's or <laughs> whatever uh but because it's doing this thing it's because it's enacting some form of violence onto populations it should be eliminated with eliminated and so dr carter will say something to the effect of you can operate from within the construction while seeking its destruction and yeah and that's what he does and when i first got in, in touch with him when i was first connected with him at howard um, I identified as a constructionist eliminativist. I didn't have the language for it, but once he yeah. taught me, I said, Oh, that, that sounds, that sounds like where I'm at. And then he revealed himself, his, yeah. her, and he said, you know, I'm a constructionist eliminativist. You're not alone. And I didn't really understand what skepticism was until a few years later when I realized I was a skeptic and then I had a clearer understanding of the difference between skepticism and constructionism. Yeah, I don't see what um, that is. 
Yeah, and most people don't. Most constructionists, I will say, don't. But it, which is is kind of challenging for me to understand. That, that I just can't see it. I'm just too conditioned to see it. I, I, I kind of don't. I kind of understand how it doesn't. How it can seem like the same thing just to to many people because when I was on the other sky wait, side wait, of I guess skepticism, one thing is you're a skeptic. Yes. Then you also have to have, I think, a position on like what I'm doing if I'm not. Oh, certainly. So, so, would, this so, is what, a, so would you say that when when others invoke race, are they then you would say that they're being constructionists? Because yeah, or naturalists. Oh, oh, you're right. I guess the, they could do it either way. No, no, but 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 unless you believe it's natural, then you would believe that the race that people create is constructed. It's not natural. It doesn't have to, like you're a skeptic. Like you don't believe in either one. Exactly. Yeah. I don't believe in either one because I recognize that what people call race or racial, they're misnaming other things that actually do exist. That's what you're saying. So yeah. they're misnaming. It's actually racism hiding its face or its ethnicity or its culture. So they're misnaming it as race. And so in that way, I say it doesn't exist as a social construction. Oh, so when either. someone invokes race, you just think they're making a mistake. Oh, 100%. I see. Yeah, yeah, I see. Yeah. yeah. Whether, they, yeah. whether they're naturalists, which is why it is important for me to really understand from a geneticist perspective, like, yeah. is, it in, is it in nature or is it not? Am I wrong about that? Or whether a person is a, is a self-proclaimed constructionist or if I identify them as one, how is it that that person views race as, as operating? And ultimately, what, what I've come to recognize is being a skeptic doesn't preclude me. In fact, it actually makes me more clear eyed and astute about the problem of racism, which I spell with the word race in it, because I'm able to, from outside of the box of racism, I'm able to identify more clearly what's happening and, and how people view race and how it manifests itself in society according to people's minds and imaginations. Um, so being a skeptic doesn't mean that I discount the fact that race is real to many people, right? And that race matters to many people. But as a skeptic, I'm able, I'm better able to see how what really matters to people is culture, which is not racial. Race doesn't create culture. Culture, if anything, creates race and all those, yeah. those other things. So, you know, it's, it's, it's something cultural or it's something ethnic. Like earlier, you were talking about how, um, how people conflate ethnicity with uh with race right yeah, so well, they no doubt yeah yeah it, yeah it's a sort of conceptual error ethnicity is pretty overrated too so i have some issues with that but yeah <laughs> i, I mean there's it's more just like as far as race is and also i mean again it's complex i think that you have a decent understanding already like race again like it makes more sense as like a large ethnic group maybe it makes more sense in in like the new world maybe but like i mean the thing thing about race is i think race exists mostly because of because of like black and white people. like at least in the u.s i'm sure you know race is like so it's like to me it's like if you eliminate if you eliminate the concept of ethnicity in in the old world like europe and africa and the middle east like that's where it's really i think performs like really poorly that's where there's the most contradiction with any concept of race that you can have. So to me, it's like, mm. yeah, you know, like if you make the group small enough, then it has some utility. But it's like, it's like, you know, you and your parents and your grandparents and your cousins, like that's a race that has like a lot of like maybe biological importance. And the thing is, it just you can't get that much bigger and have it. So I, I think that ethnicity is almost kind of somewhat useless because it's almost like family family has some biological meaning being from the same family and as you move out of that now there's exceptions right there's countries and there's people that have been like really isolated like the people on sentinel like island the last undiscovered people that we know about yeah if we if we go to them we're going to kill them with all our diseases because they don't have like you know like any like you know immunity to all the stuff that we have so like but, you know, and maybe there's a couple of thousand of them. So like they're a separate ethnicity or race, sure. But like for the vast majority of us, you don't get that much more information than you get from family. And that's, I think, the important point. It's, yeah, you know, like you're like, and by family, I mean family reunion. 
right? Like everyone right. at your family reunion, that's that's your race. That's like that's your ethnicity, and you don't have a you don't really have another umbrella much bigger that's very useful unless you're on Central Island or something, right? For most of us, we don't. Yes, and yeah. not being a geneticist, <laughs> certainly. <laughs> I also share a more expanded view of what ethnicity is. Like if you listen, folks can listen back to some of my um, podcasts where I talk about, I I think what would be more generative and fruitful in American society is to view American as, as ethnicity um, and, and, and as an ethnicity and as a term American is the term I'm referencing as a term, embracing the understanding that that term applies to all of us in this nation. When you were talking earlier about the tendency to to think about race and to go back, you know, a thousand years or something like that, um, and to not, the tendency to not go back a sooner point in time and how go, depending on the time you choose, one's race, right, perceived race could change or could be different. Um, that resonated with that aspect of what you were saying earlier resonated with me because it made me think about how I view American, how I view ethnicity, how I view culture and cultural formation, and how I think it would be more generative for more people to embrace American as including, as including all of us, which, which I take to also mean, I take that to also mean that it's not understood as we're all the same, right? There, I'm not saying American is like, it's, we're, we should aspire to assimilate or go for some kind of hegemonic thing or, or anything like that. I'm really pointing to the fact that because racialist ideology has operated as it has in, the, in this country, the word American was initially crafted and really referencing racialized white men primarily, right? Over time, that that has changed. But the fact that we remain convinced because we are so obsessed with race and color. That's um, so interesting because what you're saying is actually, I agree with you, but I'm realizing I'm wrong about something, which is tough because there's something I love about this country and that, that there is no ethnicity that like a French guy is just French and a German guy is German. But in, an American is like never, unless you're a Native American, you're, you're like oh, American, but my family's Dutch or, you know, whatever. right. And it's like, in some ways it's so good, but, but I think in that vacuum, we've, we've, we've replaced it with race. Right. Yes. And yes, it's like, it's like, we do need a, an American identity. And I think like a good, and it can be, you know, like, sure. If your parents are from China and you got here yesterday, then you're Chinese American. But it's like if right. your parents were born in America and there's no one alive in your family that's like outside of America, then you're American, right? Yes. Like, like that can be the time scale, right? It's fair that not everyone's equally American because some people just got here and some people are like tourists, right? But like, right. because you can't make everyone American. But yeah, like some <laughs> rule like that, but it's like we're all playing by the same rules. Like if you're like a citizen and like your parents are from here and your grandparents are from here, like, okay, your great grandparents, you never knew them. Right. So it's like, right. and it's, it's interesting because on, yeah, on one hand you like that America doesn't have a strong identity because in France there's this identity of being French and you have this idea that like a black Frenchman will never be French, but actually sort of why not? Right. It's actually harder for a black American to be white. Right. So like having all of the white people in America not identify as American which somehow it seems seems more honest in a way, but instead they're identifying as European. And since a lot of them don't know where they came from, you know, except for, you know, they just identify as white. And so now the majority of people are identifying as something that like a subset of the immigrants can never have, right? Which is like, yeah, the French are notoriously racist, but they don't have to be. They can let other people be French, right? Because they're not even French themselves, right? So it's like, so you so what you're saying is almost like it's not a race where you're talking about but like nationality or so okay so you believe in reconstructing ethnicity i do because I, I, that makes I, more sense I, yeah i see i think so you need I think something it, but it should be race yeah because yeah. when i think when i think of american like when i think of the idea of it and how it's how it it's different iterations have um been across time there is a way in which it's understood that american the default 
attachment or presumption to that is is white is whiteness Um, and there's a way in which there's a way in which historically that was accurate (laughs) based on the climate of the country right and like who had political power and then who really didn't Um, but now in 2021 I think that the the tides have shifted and the fact that more too many people still don't see that word as um as sufficiently describing them or their family's stories, I think is part of the the quagmire of racialist ideology that racialist ideology creates and keeps us divided from ourselves and other people. Because yeah. as you've said, many of us, uh, like, so I'm ADOS, I'm an American descendant of, of enslaved people. And my family, I look at them as American, you know, I look at them as American because they were, and they were, they were here. They helped build America. They helped shape America. They, and all the way along all of the different journeys of, you know, emancipation and, and reconstruction and Jim Crow and civil rights movement, uh, all of the time periods, my family was existing and thriving and being American and participating in American culture, because we know that when people came over to the, to this land, they did disconnect from their countries of origin. Culturally, they disconnected and also politically, um, they yeah, you're right. It. Wow. It's and like, so yeah. then they they create they create there's this weird America. conflation where like because if you're black you're not as American so they almost will group in immigrants with black people but black people have been here longer than all the than you know ninety percent of all the white Americans so it's weird to like because you don't have an American identity black is kind of different Supposedly. immigrants are kind of yeah. different so you're like the same as someone who just got here which doesn't really make any sense it's totally inaccurate right it's like it's weird that this country i mean probably canada has the same quirk but like mexico like i mean i don't know if you know there's a there's a boxer named canelo alvarez and canelo in spanish means uh what, cinnamon and he has he has red hair right and like he's incredibly mexican this dude has like a mariachi band he like barely learned how to speak english even though he's a famous boxer he'd probably be good for his pr but he just doesn't care he like <laughs> stays in mexico he trains in mexico it's like he's mexican <laughs> you know and it's like someone's like yeah but that's weird that he that's like he he doesn't even think for a second that like well my ancestors came from ireland or spain or wherever the hell they came from he's just mexican Right. And it's like that kind of like they have that, like they have national identity, but like, mm-hmm. and they also have mixed identity. Like there's, there's natives, there's a, a smaller slave population, but it existed. And there are indigenous people, but they still have a mix. And I'm sure some people, I'm sure there's, you know, there are some internal problems there, but, and I'm sure like the whites and the indigenous, you know, but they still have a Mexican identity. You know, yeah. he is Mexican. And right. you don't have that really in the US, which is, weird like why did we not get that like like, do you know why i don't even know you know why did we miss out on that i think we do have it in the sense that it that it has um been understood and presumed to pertain to racialized white people and that everyone else has been hyphenated and you have people like trevor noah who's south african my one of my friends charles at kokotu charles if you hear shout out to you from critical african thinkers he's nigerian all people from outside of the states have made this observation that in American society, it seems like Americans don't haven't recognized how white people get written into American and everyone else gets hyphenated and how sort of like nefarious that is. And it doesn't make logical sense to people that Americans would racialize as black who live outside of this country, but then in this country, we kind of take it as um, we, we, because racialist ideology operates in the ways that it does, we take it as if something is absent or missing. If we were to just call ourselves American, we feel like because, um, because of the history of enslavement, because our ancestors presumably kept come from the continent of Africa, that we have to hyphenate, we have to put Black in front of American, or we have to put African in front of American. And I think that that is, you know, that is part of the hard work that I do at Theory of Racism is helping people disentangle all of these things. But I think it also in the embracement of 
of this this idea that we have to hyphenate or this idea yeah. that something is absent if we call ourselves American, just full stop American, I think that keeps the quagmire of division um, persisting and going. And I don't think it's accidental because we know historically that was intentional. And now we might, we might not, we might have a harder time seeing how it's problematic to continue to think like that and to divide ourselves from each other and think of ourselves in very segregated ways. But when I think of the Johnny Otis's of the world or the Rachel Dolezal's of the world or the John B's of the world, when I think about humans, period, I think about how cultural formation is is multidirectional. American and America created its own culture and ethnicity upon these lands, which uh, which you know, if we do trace our DNA, we would be pleasantly surprised. I think at how um, complicated and complex our ancestry histories are, as you said, and I think that if we want to pass something else on to our children. Not just the idea that all, all of our children can accomplish anything that they want to accomplish, but also this um, sense of unity and living up to American ideas and uh, ideals and values. I think that we have to take a different path forward and look at America and see ourselves in the word American and mm -hmm. recognize that that in, in adopting that language for ourselves, nothing is missing for all of the reasons that I feel like we've expressed throughout our talk today, you know, because. I mean, I had a colleague tell me that he's cheap because he's Scottish. And it's like, bro, <laughs> you're not Scottish. Like, you're born in like the Midwest. <laughs> like, you're like, there's nothing in common with you and Scots. Like they would be like, who's this guy? Like, but there's, but what is that, that it just, I'm just thinking about Canelo is like, in, I'm just thinking, okay, if a white guy did that, he came out with like an American flag. I don't know. He was eating like a hamburger or like, I don't know, he was eating like some apple pie or had like a, I don't know, Bruce Springsteen playing. Like we'd call him <laughs> racist. And if a black guy came out and a black guy was like, had an American flag on and was like the black American boxer who loves America, we'd call him weird. We'd and call like, him a white supremacist. We'd probably call yeah. him a racist too. Yeah. yeah. Well, now we would. Now we would. We would now. Right. Yeah. yeah. Maybe we'd five years ago, we would just be weird. We'd be like, that's weird. But yeah. now yeah, we would, we'd, we'd actually call him racist now, which is we, we went. But it's weird that, yeah, like being American is being racist. Yeah. And that's, yeah. that's to me that my evidence for saying how um, the idea of American, what that is, has been conflated with whiteness that's because what's reason. also yeah. conflated with whiteness is being racist. So yeah, if, right. if so okay. long as we keep conflating all of those things and the tensions that you and I are interested in, you wow, know. Wow, yeah. I never thought of it like that, honestly. That's really, that's good. That's good. I'm glad yeah. I could, you know. No, yeah, that helps Teach you some, anything. Yeah, I know. Right? I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, because people think differently. And yeah, I never thought about American identity and what it really is. Because you're right. Yeah, we would yeah. call it. Yeah, you're not really allowed to be it. Yeah. Yeah. And, yes. Yeah. And, and even today, and, like, I think, do you think that we, we're, we're off track? Because I feel like, I saw to my friend, he's West African, like he's a, and he was talking about how when he first got to America, he would hear things like, well, you know, in America, every man has a right to his opinion. Like, there would just be like, and I even feel like growing up, you know, like, if you grew up somewhere, it's almost like a, it, it's really nice because it's also like, you know, if you're from a place where people fight a lot, it's like a good dodge, right? Because someone can say something about you and you can and be like, yeah, well, it's America, you know, it's, people are free to say what they want. And now I feel like I don't hear that as much. And I don't hear like, well, yes, yeah, America, so you got to let people do what they want. You know, like, it's almost like the, maybe at some time we were leaning towards some positive conception of America, but now it seems more and more like, and maybe it's also an effect of Trump, right? Because he, he played into those tropes so much that being American and then the, like, the opposition to Trump really was, is to just, is to say America is racist. Yes. Yeah. Yes. It's and in and, and the the rhetoric that people often use is like racism is in the DNA of America. So we can see again how whiteness is conflated with being racist, which is conflated with being American, which is which then leads to this sort of uh, cognitive dissonance when it comes to people embracing that the idea of American as speaking to them and including them. I think we're definitely off track. And the one of the primary reasons is 
the nefarious ways in which racialist ideology continues to persist. And while we made tremendous strides over the, the centuries and over the decades and over the recent years, I think that based on public discourse, current public discourse, I think that we have gone backwards in a lot of ways, in, in ways that um, will be hard to undo or rewind if we don't get a, a grip on this sooner than later. And yeah. part of that is the influence of some part of academia, right? Because you have these people like Ibram X. Kendi or Robin DiAngelo talking about how you know, whiteness is this um, violent thing, white supremacy, white privilege, racism, America's racist. Um, they're taking the Kyle um, Rittenhouse trial and the results of that and saying, this is proof that America is racist. There's no justice system. I mean, everything now is being labeled as racist because we are, we have reverted in some ways to seeing race everywhere, which then it, it inspires more people than not to see racism everywhere, which is part of my evidence almost, that it's the doesn't same. Doesn't it seem thing. almost like a conspiracy to you a little bit? Because like, I'll, I'll admit, I didn't follow the Calvert and House trial that well or any of the trials, but it seemed like to me <laughs> that while that one was going on, there was another trial going on that seemed, and I didn't look super close, seemed like better evidence of racial I'm murder. Arbery. Yeah. Yes. But they didn't talk about that one because it's almost like, why, like, yeah, if you want to point towards, like, look, you know, if, if you want to hate on America, that seems like a, a, a good point, right? right? Like, I don't think you have to always be so, like, patriotic, or, you know, or, I mean, I think it's okay to say something bad about your country, like, be self-critical, right? So it's like, that seemed like a, a I, I don't know the whole story, so I can't be sure, but from what I saw, I just, that seemed bad, you know, that seemed like that's the one you would talk about, but it's almost like, no, let's, let's bring up the one that's contentious. Let's talk about how this one's race, even though, like, the racial aspects are not are just not there. It's almost like, but it's but like the the other people. It's like, but because people on the right, the racists, support him, let's argue about this one. But the, for the Ahmad Arbery, I mean, I don't have a ton of friends who are really conservative, but like, I think a lot of conservative people are like that. Yeah, that that was murder. That was bad. So it's like we can't look at this as a sign. We have to look at the one that there's people on the other side to fight with. So you're not really like looking at the Kyle Rittenhouse trial or the Ahmad Arbery trial. Like they're they're meaningless, right? They're like characters. You're like you're looking at what are they saying on Fox News, you know? And if the guys on Fox News are like, "Ooh, Ahmad Arbery, that that was murder and it was racist, that was bad," like, well, okay, that's not that's not interesting, right? So you're not like the actual trial isn't evidence. It's like what people are. It's like maybe it's because of the pandemic. But it's it's like insane. It's like. The trial should be the story, but the story is what do they think about the trial? It's like, what do my enemies think about it? Let me oppose my enemies. Well, your enemies 100%. aren't the guys that like murdered this guy. Those aren't those aren't actually your enemies. Your enemies are are the people talking about the guys that murdered this guy. Like it's so insane, right? Yes, and and part. I mean, yes, in my humble opinion, yes, um, for a lot of reasons, right? Like the the Kyle Rittenhouse case gets cast as proof of of racism for a, a few reasons, including the fact that this happens at a BLM protest, that the people that were shot um, were, I guess, with the, the protesters while, while Kyle was there to be against the pro protesters, all of this other stuff. And so now the judge had some missteps, prosecutor had some missteps, everyone said some messed up stuff or potentially mess up stuff throughout the, the trial. And so now because Kyle gets, um, he's found not guilty, it's evidence of racism. Did, did, but did the that problem, happen? Did he get found not guilty? Is it over? He did, yes, yeah, yes. Okay. It was um, a few hours ago. So, right. so yeah. it's like relatively new news. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, he was found not guilty. And so right. now some people are saying, okay, well now let's pay attention to the Ab Ab Ahmad Arbery case, right? But yeah. the, the problem... The, the problem that I see that um, that inflames all of this stuff is like, number one, this idea, the conflation of conservatism with being racist. OK, because then that's also the conflation is that to be conservative is to be white, because by most people's definitions, people who aren't racialized as white can't be racist. So there's yeah. the, the all kinds of um, intellectual leaps that one has to make. 
Um, and then also the fact that uh, that people being people will cher often cherry pick uh, what they focus on and what they take as evidence. And so I think earlier you brought this up. It was like the confirmation bias is real, right? Like people, pe because we're taught to see race everywhere, we see racism everywhere, which surprise, surprise is further evidence of what I say when I say racism is race. It's the same thing. But because we don't acknowledge that that reality, we think that racism is everywhere. It's omnipresent. And so everywhere we look, we're going to kind of, I think it's a subconscious thing, truth be told, pick and choose what we take as evidence of what we already believe, which is that America is racist um, and that yeah. racism is everywhere. It's inescapable. And I mean, there right. are just, like, I just, I just thought like, I don't know that the Ahmaud Arbery case, and I don't know it too well, but I have no idea that it's racist. I thought it looks like it's murder, right? right. But is it racist? Like, I, I have no idea, right? It's like, like I, I, I don't know though. I mean, I assume rednecks are racist. I mean, but I don't know that that's true. And it's probably not a good assumption, right? To see a redneck and assume uh, he's a conservative guy from like Mississippi or I forget where they're from, but like some state that, you know, but it's like, that's my own, just that's my own bias. I'm assuming that if a, a, some redneck killed a black guy, he's probably racist, but probably the minority of murders that are because they're racist, probably people just fight. Right. And it's like, but yeah, it's like, I just see that. And it, that one's harder not to see for me. Right. Right. So it's like the Kyle Rittenhouse one, it was hard to see as racist. Right. But they found a way to do it. People still did. But I admit that, yeah, that moderate, it's hard to not see as racist. It's hard to just see as murder. Right. And, and not do that. I mean, that's why, yeah, that case is not as famous, but it's still somewhat famous because it has the race element. Right. Right. I mean, yeah. it's just like um, with, with uh, it's, 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 similar to the aftermath of George Floyd, right? Yeah. Where you have, um, forgive me, I know George Floyd's name. I do not know the name of the racialized white person where it was very like scarily similar, knee on the neck, died. Oh, Tony Kippa. Yeah, yeah, I, I saw something about him. Yeah, that was terrible. Right? Yeah, yeah. That doesn't get it. That doesn't, that doesn't fit the narrative of racism yeah. in America. And so that doesn't get that much radio play or attention. And this is this is the the quagmire that racialist ideology and just um number one upholding it but then also not not be not properly naming and identifying what the problem is which is racism creates race then we see racism everywhere and if we see racism everywhere then it is everywhere to your point about you know what people think is a reality then becomes or is the person's reality even if it's not a reality to me from my perspective right yeah. and if that's the case then and if this is something that we are imparting on the children or if it's just something that we accept as truths for ourselves it does prevent more many people too many people from seeing themselves in a, in the the word American, right? Which, which yeah. I think has its downfalls because the, the idea of nation is obviously a human construction, right? So, so it's a, it's a figment of our imaginations, but there are benefits to having a sort of nationalist pride and identity, which like you said, does not mean it does not preclude a person from criticizing the nation rightfully so because there's no nation on earth that is perfect, but it, there is something to be said about having those positive feelings feelings and, and the sort of negative impact of not just being taught or, or not just believing that the ceiling is lower for you based on fill in the blank reason that are out of your control, right? But also the sort of nefarious effect of believing that the country, your country, your nation is against you in these like inescapable yeah. oh, ways so it's, so bad. Um, yeah. it's it's not this is not a good and and healthy thing that we should be wanting for people or encouraging it's primarily because if we look at evidence in a in as unbiased a way as we can we would come to find that some of our beliefs are misconceptions that sound true these things sound true but upon further examination and analysis we find that they're not true and yeah. if and it's actually better that we 
that it's not true. It's act, that's actually the ideal. It's good, but it's it it can be hard to accept the sort of untruth of of anything, right? Yeah, because I go so far as even if it was a little bit true, it's still probably better for you to not think it's true. Or right? or right? so least, like if something's a tiny bit against you, it might be better to just go through your life not even thinking that. And we're going the other way and saying like you better not ever miss something like. Like, don't ever misinterpret something as not being racist. Like, don't right. ever underestimate the challenge. It's like, well, no, actually, right. sure, ideally get it right, but you should probably err on the side of not realizing, right? Like, err on the side of not realizing that the odds are so stacked against you because it's hard to make it. And that's what I try and say for sport. Like, in sport, if you look at some of the, the like, you know, I'm a big fan of this guy named uh, Jonathan Edwards. He's the greatest triple jumper of all time. He's white and he's British and like no one's ever come close to him. Like he's so far ahead of everyone else. He's actually a really fascinating person. He was like a chemist and a physicist and he became a track athlete. He didn't succeed until he was older. And then like he, and then he was super religious. So he wouldn't jump on Sundays. And then like maybe 10 years ago, he was doing a Christian show. I think he even got divorced and he came out one day and he was no longer a believer. He's just like, it was, I shouldn't laugh at him because his, but it was so scientific. He was like, I just think the odds of the Christian story being true are, are unlikely. I just don't believe in it anymore. And it's like, well, I mean, how did you just realize this now? But hey, you know, like he decided he can be religious. And so now he talks about that and he talks about it. And one of the big things he says is like, yeah, I'm not religious, but there's no way in hell I could have been the greatest of all time had I not been. Right. Like it's such an insane thing to believe, to believe that, no, you're the best out of like billions of people, like you're going to be the best. So it's like, that's probably not true for most people. And it probably isn't even almost true for the one it happened to, but like, you don't get that without that belief. And in sports, you see this all the time. Like people who are the best are almost, it's almost unhealthy in some ways. They're like a little bit insane. Right. We're talking like the greatest athletes in the world. Right. But it's, I don't think everyone needs to be like that, but it is true that like you have to have some, some, some amount of self-belief, you know, some amount of idea that like you're going to make it. And I, I, I see it in, in black historical culture in the U S maybe there was like a religious revival culture where you, you know, you thought like you're chosen or like you're special. So, you, you know, you'll be free and you'll make it, you know, th th there are some elements of that, but the current, the current narrative I see is, definitely that it's going to be harder for you and you're probably going to fail. And that just seems, that scene seems really bad. And then, and then for white people, it seems like if, if you don't make it, you should feel bad because you misused all your advantages. Right. So it just doesn't seem like a very inspiring narrative for anybody. Right. So like, it's almost like trying to, it, I, I guess it's, it's like trying to cure, like trying to come up, come up with a healthier, more honest way to view race fails as well. It just fails in a different way, but it's, it's, it's just like, trying to positively racialize doesn't work and that's maybe why this happened so some well-meaning people have decided that like oh let's do this right we did it wrong before and they're doing it but they, but you can only do it wrong like you can only do race wrong right there isn't a good way to do it i mean because it, it, it's it's just it's too big of an idea to imagine that like everybody like that you're in a group of 40 million people and these other 200 million people all think this that just, that just doesn't make sense. So yeah, I mean, yeah, you, you've, you've pushed me towards uh, the, the, the illumination side of, of it, actually. <laughs> Although I still think that horoscope level appreciation for race is pretty close to illumination. Yeah. 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 So and it's I almost think the same. it's like, I guess I'm not an eliminate. I'm a, I'm a absurdist. There's a fourth one. Like turn it in, like I'm reconstructing it into something absurd. Yeah. Which is close to, that's basically, basically like make it go away. Yeah. Yeah. One, one thing that you just said that's um, resonating with me is, is this idea of like, well, actually we can't positively racialize somebody because, you know, very well in with, with even the best of intentions, it just seems to how it gets practiced is the thing, right? And you have some people in academia and out in the media who will contend with the assertion that CRT is happening in primary, primary school, right? Because yeah. they say, no, it's not like, give me proof, blah, 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 blah. But it's like, okay, I think you and I, we're both in academia, and yet we are crystal clear that 
how a thing is in academia is not how the thing is in yeah. on the ground, right? Like yeah. it, they're, the way it's being applied is what we're talking about here. And there's yeah. plenty of evidence to uphold some of the assertions that we've made and observations that we've made. Um, so part of part of what I do then is to not my this is my skepticism part i don't racialize people and i don't yeah. encourage people to racialize themselves and i in fact i invite them to see themselves as raceless human beings and from this position of racelessness which i find people to be mo mostly compelled to do because there's nothing positive about being racialized as you're just saying <laughs> then we can better analyze the problem of racism and name yeah. it and get creative about solutions. <clears throat> I guess what I just realized is the, the only way that a constructionist viewpoint can or a reconstructionist viewpoint can work, it has to work sort of within within each race. Are you there? Yes. Oh uh, yeah. It has to work within race, right? So I'm I mean, one reason I got into this like idea that maybe some type of positive Afrocentric viewpoint is good was I volunteered one time at a Jewish school and like their 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 um their keynote speaker or whatever that talked to them was like from Einstein to I don't know Mark Zuckerberg like we've always been there to save the world when you know and it was like this super positive identity thing and I think that like I guess I've been sympathetic to that viewpoint among among black people and among different types of people but the thing is that only works if we're segregated, right? That can be a way for like black people to make gains against white people, but it can't be across the country. And that's the thing, like you need segregation to uphold that. And I don't think we're gonna go back to that. So like right now, everyone's part of the conversation and white people are a huge part of the conversation. So if they're, if, if they're part of the solution, then you can't, you can't have them, them agreeing that black people are superior to them so instead they have themselves sort of admitting their own inferiority, which is strange, right? Because you can't have white people being like, black people invented everything, they're better than us, right? It's like, it just, that just doesn't seem like, it, like something people are gonna say. So, so yeah, you end up with this thing where if you're gonna have people of all colors involved in reconstructing it, in, in, in re reconstructing it, which I think is what you have, then they reconstruct it outside of color. And I think that's what you see now is they're reconstructing race as politics, right? Where all the, all the white and black people that are on one side that are like the Democrats, they are basically a race. And it's just, but, but of course they're not because they're, they're still using the original construction. And then the other group of people are just the racists. And it doesn't matter if you're black or white, if you're on the other side, you're a racist. And so they basically made two new races, which is the non-racist and the racist. But that's what happens, right? If you ask the people to reconstruct it, they're gonna make new groups and they're just gonna be even stranger and even more inconsistent. So yeah, it's the right, it's just not something that we can improve. We, we can't improve on this together, right? We can maybe make gains separately, but yeah, it's, it's, not, it's not something that we can do together. And just segregation on the whole is, is not, it's not worth the trade-off. So I, I think that makes sense. Yeah. Hey, Tade, I'm Amazing. going to. Um, Are there any chats or anything? Yes, yeah, so I'm gonna. I'm gonna take a look at the chat box and see if we have any questions to ask. I will also say that we should definitely do a part two because clearly we have a lot to talk about. Yeah. Yeah, so I would good. welcome that. Um, let's see. Somebody said. Is it possible to change the parts of the DNA code that are inactive versus active? And is it possible to influence which the RNA are which RNA our cells produce? This is the same person asking these questions. Okay, I'll let me back to my Zoom. Oh yeah, because you can see them here too, right? So yeah, I tried to, but then I lost the I can't see the R chat now. Hold on, I gotta find it. Let's see. There's one. Uh, there is one. So you, you just tell me because I'm having trouble with it. So, um, okay. so what's the question? Can you change the DNA? Yeah. Can you change the parts of the DNA code that are active or uh, versus inactive? Well, I mean, we have like, you know, in theory, you can uh, CRISPR, right? So there's, there's a technique that was built from like a piece of bacteria and you can, you can change DNA. 
in theory, you could like inject a virus and the, the virus would go in and like edit the DNA of all your cells. I mean, this is science fiction as of now. I mean, we've done it on like uh, mushrooms and like a few different, I mean, I think in China, there's a paper where they made a monkey's hair blonde, but I mean, it's, uh, it's difficult, right? It's, but yeah, you can change. I mean, in theory, you can change the DNA, the, uh, you can change, I think by active, he means like the coding region. So the part that codes for proteins, which is the more active part, right? So then the non-coding regions probably still has some functional um, elements to it, but the, the coding region is the part that turns into mRNA and that part turns into protein. And yeah, you can change that. If you change that, you'll change the like organism. But as far as I know, I don't think people are doing that in humans with the exception of there's a therapy given to uh, people that are having a kid where they can, it's not only changing the DNA, but they can insert a mitochondria from a donor in if there's a mitochondrial disease for the fetus. So you basically are swapping in genes, but you're doing that on the mitochondria, right? And if you, if you know your biology, the mitochondria is a circular genome. So it's like a bacteria and things are a lot easier with bacteria. When you get to human chromosomes, they're, 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 things are, are, are a lot harder. But yeah, in theory, sure, you can do it, but we can't do it. I don't think we can do it now. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't trust someone if they said they can. So what's the other question? Something about the RNA? Yes. Is it possible to influence which RNA our cells produce? Yeah. So, I mean, your cells create, I mean, that's what hormones do, right? So if you inject testosterone, right, the hormone goes to the cell nucleus and it starts turning on RNAs, which turn on proteins to build muscle, right? Some people take steroids, they're changing which, which, proteins get expressed and what that means is you know which which of the messenger rnas get turned on and i'm not super up on my endocrinology but i think it's mostly that it, i don't think it's they're actually causing the translation i think they're actually i mean if, if it's not testosterone i'm sure that there is an example of this but yeah they that where you can turn on genes essentially so you can definitely do that i don't know if of course, testosterone is like a, a natural molecule, right? It exists biologically. And even the synthetic hormones, they're basically mimicking the action of testosterone. Now, I don't know if we know how to do that to turn on an mRNA um, in sort of a, an unnatural way. Like, let's say, oh, I want to turn on this mRNA in the heart that never happens, right? We can, but we can definitely make synthetic hormones. But of course, hormones are the things that are already turning on your RNA. Right. But, but, but I mean, that, that's in that influencing gene expression in general is the more, is the more, the more, I mean, in my opinion, the more uh, near term technology, right? Because we already can do it. And, um, ch you know, you change a hormone, you're going to change that, uh, the way the gene expression gets turned on slightly. So I, I would say that we've already done it in, in, and, but the, the more maybe complex ways of doing it, that might be in the future. How can we increase our general intelligence? I'm sorry. How can we increase our general intelligence and cognitive abilities beyond the scope of general intelligence? Do you have an answer for that? I mean, well, I think, <laughs> so I think that um, part of what I think anonymous is asking here. I'm pretty sure he was the asker of this question. It speaks to what you and I are both interested in, essentially, is this question of nature versus nurture. So when you and I first met, you were talking uh, about how our DNA, there might be certain aspects that predispose us to certain um, outcomes but that ultimately the environment is going to be more of a determining factor in terms of whether or not those genes get expressed in the ways that the, the, the DNA might be predicting it might be expressed. So when, this, when we're asking this question of general intelligence um, and knowing um, the asker of this question and the kind of data that they're interested in, when we think of somebody like Charles Murray's um, um, work and some of the conclusions that I think he infers, even if not outright says, um, 
it's along the lines of what I've seen people saying on Twitter that I then tag you in because I know you're going to come <laughs> and drop some knowledge, uh, which is this idea that genetically speaking, some groups, racial groups would be um, better at at STEM, right, or 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 inferior in, in certain ways. We're talking IQ and things like that. Um, and so, is there a way in which a person can essentially beat beat their DNA? Yeah. So, okay. So, I mean, I let's just call it IQ, right? So that's that's what people mean by this, and whatever that means. And so, first, I would say that I think as IQ exists, it's a it's a measure of low intelligence, but it's not very predictive on the top side. And so, yeah, I mean there are racial differences. Like I looked at, I, I looked it up and there's a higher incidence of down syndrome in Hispanic American babies. It's, it's small, but, and it's because the average age of the, the mother at birth is slightly higher. And that could have changed. That was one year, but it's like, yeah, if there's a difference, if one race is more likely or one group is more likely to have kids with down syndrome, then the average IQ will be lower in that group. But I think you know, intellectual disability is real. I think there are people born with Down syndrome and there are, you know, birth like defects. I don't know if that's a, a, a politically correct word to use, but there are ways where people are born unable to learn. But beyond, but the real thing that they want to know is are some people born smart, right? Like that's what people really, and, and that I would say the best analogy I, I give for that is I would say, okay, like for you, I'd say, what's your, what's your AQ? And AQ, for you, Sheena, like, what do you think your AQ is? And AQ is your athletic quotient. Yeah. So what do you think you score? Let's say if 100 is the mean, what's your AQ? Oh my gosh. I have no idea. Right. So well, here's, <laughs> here's the thing, like there, let's say we, we look at, I don't know, LeBron James and Tom Brady, and cause he's the best football player. And like, uh, so LeBron James is probably the best basketball player in my opinion. I don't watch baseball enough to know, but maybe that guy in the Yankees is really good or is a pitcher, right? So, I, you know, you, ta you take the top five guys in the most popular sports and I, there's no measure you can give me where they're all going to be really excellent, right? Like you make Tom Brady jump and he can run fast. He can't run fast, right? So but maybe I, I, I don't know if, well, LeBron James can probably throw a football, but, you know, like I'm, I'm, the point is you're, you're going to have a hard time getting all these guys to score off the charts but they're all off the chart on athletics right they're all amazing but however none of them would score really low you, you could come up with an aq and all of them are like mobile healthy like fit they're all above average they're at least average but probably i mean considering the obesity rate they're, they're probably well above average for their age right so clearly um AQ again is really useful for determining like that they might be a professional, but it's not determining, you know, it, it, you can't come up with a single measure for being an excellent uh, like person in sports. And then I would say, now think about the difference between sports and intelligence. Like we are as humans, incredibly poor athletes. Like we're one of the slowest animals. We're incredibly weak. Like, but we're really intelligent and our intelligence is far more complex than our ability to do sports. So why would you imagine that you can't even make an AQ measurement that predicts sports ability, but you can predict one, but you can have one for intelligence. Like that just seems so nonsensical. So my advice to somebody who's asking, how can I improve my IQ is, well, let's just hope it's not really low. Like, let's hope you don't suffer from intellectual disability. And that's unfortunately not so much in your hands. Like if your mother, you know, didn't eat at all when she was pregnant, you know, or you're in, exposed to some, you know, environmental toxin, you might suffer from something where it's going to be hard. And then, you know, with therapy, you can probably improve your IQ, but it might be hard. Right. And, and that's sad. And but it, given that you're not there, given that you're, you know, above the bottom 10 percentile or something, I would look at it the same as your IQ or as your AQ. I would say, well, I'm glad that my AQ makes me sufficient to play sports. Now I'm going to get really good at my sport. And so I would I wouldn't worry about your like general intelligence. Like if you're thinking about that, if you're that interested in intelligence, I'm going to assume that you have enough general intelligence right? And most people do that. It's not the limiting factor. Like it's only the limiting factor when it's very low. 
And so given that you have enough, I would worry about your, your specific intelligence. And yeah, there's carryover. It's not like, you know, and, and, you know, what, it, if you want to be good at math, you should do a lot of math. And if you want to be good at, you know, science, you should really like study your science. And, you know, those are fields that have more than one topic. So yeah, you, you got to do them all, but just like when you run track, you get, you got to, you know, stretch, you got to lift, you got to run, like, you know, it's going to involve more than one thing, but and I think the proof of that is like the, I know brilliant scientists who are fools on some subjects, right? So like, I don't think it, I think general intelligence has utility only on the bottom end of the range. And there it's telling you some type of disability, but I don't think it's, I don't think you can, and I don't think you should, you should just say, Hey, what do I want to be good at? And you, you know, you'll find you have some better abilities. Like my sister's great at like learning tons of languages. And unfortunately I'm not, and I was always better at, at math. I wish I was really good at languages. So I have to work harder, a little harder, you know, like we're all different, but like, I'm sure if I really had spent as much time as she has, I'd be a lot better, even if I, I might not be as good as her, but like, yeah, just do like focus on your specific intelligence and it'll like focus on the thing that you like the most, get and learn as much about that as you can. And that will bleed over and you'll have other like types of intelligence that are increased, but there is no, like, there is no general intelligence that really matters provided don't, that it's not really low. Yeah. In the same question, the person asked about, could CRISPR help? Yeah. So CRISPR is what I talked about gene editing. Um, again, sure. It's really science fiction now, because again, we don't know, we, we know even less about intelligence than we know about sports when it comes to genetics. I and mean, people sometimes just, we know the brain is such a black box. Like if there is, again, I don't think it can maybe help with your intelligence, but like, it's just such a mystery. I, I almost don't want to say anything, but it's possible that like we could, I don't even think it would be gene editing though, but it's possible that like we could do something like increase your verbal memory or increase your ability to memorize numbers, which would then maybe speed up your ability to learn. But I mean, we don't know really like there's a, like, there's weird case studies. There's guys who have fallen and hit their head and then gain incredible memory after that. There's people with like almost perfect autobiographical memory. So certainly like if we knew what trigger that was, I don't know that's necessarily a genetic trigger. Obviously in these cases, probably not. But yeah, there's probably, I mean, if it's happened and we see a pattern, then there's probably a way to do that, but we don't know. So yeah, I don't, I don't think you need the gene editing even to do that. You could probably do that without it, but yeah, who knows? Um, how long do you think before artificial intelligence unlike, unlocks a deeper understanding of allele combinations? Oh, that's tough. Yeah, so, uh, well, there's, so allele combinations, I am gonna assume, I know what he means. I'm gonna, or she, or they, or whoever. I'm gonna assume by allele combinations, this person is somewhat up to speed on genetics and the current sort of state of the art genetics for like, um, for like polygenic traits, say like schizophrenia or something like this, is we look at all the alleles and we look at a significance level for what for whether each allele uh, increases or decreases the incident. So, it, so every allele is either protective or it increases risk. And then we add them all up in a linear fashion. And we do that because the amount of combinations, if we tried to like cycle through all of them would be incredibly massive, right? Because if you have a thousand things and you try to you try to like find combinations, the search space is too big. So you'd find hits that were fake and it's combinatorially really hard. Um, whether that's solved through, I don't think the solution, I, I think, yes, I think there's probably something we can, we can probably do better on the model. You can probably do a better job with risk prediction and genetics and so I don't want, this is a spoiler because this is a project I'm trying to get a grant for. So I, I maybe shouldn't say too much, but I think this, the key to that is understanding the sociology behind, I think that's the problem. That's why that's hard. So I, I don't know if the solution is necessarily some advanced AI that cracks that code. I think that it's hard to figure out 
how alleles combine or how alleles work to, to predict a trait because our sociological differences are poorly understood. And we're seeing more and more that as long as you care about a trait in society, it becomes really hard to predict what the, the, the genetic ideology of that trait. And so the example I like to give is like, you know, if you don't care and, you know, like my favorite example is the, so there's a test where they look at the SIB based prediction. So that means like this allele increases your risk in society. But then let's say that you have this allele, but your sibling doesn't have it. And what you see is it doesn't help you much against your sibling. All right. We see that a lot. And it doesn't help you, you much against your sibling because the like part of the reason why that allele, like let's just real silly, let, let, let's just say there's an allele that makes you like really clever, it has a small effect size, and your parents have this allele. So they go to college and they're really educated. And then you grew up with them and you have this allele. It, it truly does make you slightly more clever. But it, your parents also had enough of these alleles that they went to college. So now there's this huge bonus fact because you grew up in an environment with, with parents that went to college. And so that means that you, if you have this allele and your sibling does not, it doesn't do a very good job doing a prediction, but it does when you look at you versus someone not in your family. So, and that's because basically any outcome has a massive effect. And then you see like nonlinearity is like an example of that is imagine that you have a genetic basis to become an alcoholic. And you do, and then your parents, and then you have kids, and your kids inherit those same alleles, and they inherit a mother who's an alcoholic, and they say, I'm never going to drink again, right? So it's almost so they inherited all this risk for alcoholism, but they also inherited a mother that drinks a lot, and so they decide to never drink. So now you have, a, so now you have, if your genetic risk is too high, then you actually have the opposite, right? So it's not, so again, so these things are hard. I think the, the solution to understanding them is sort of understanding how that is, is to understand the EDEs, right? The environmentally dependent effects on genetics. But sure, I mean, I'm not, you know, who knows? Maybe the solution comes from from computer science. It's possible. I mean, it, it'll involve computing, that's for sure. Okay, thank you so much. Um, so one person asked, uh, ethnicity is something you're born into, right? So I want, I want to address that um, briefly. Um, so ethnicity is in part something one is born into, but as ethnicity includes DNA and ancestry and all of those things, it also includes culture, which includes religion, which includes nationality, it includes a host of other uh, practices, traditions, and things, right? So there's a way in which there's a, f there's a far more elastic, fluid, um, understanding of how ethnicity is traditionally defined that speaks to the fact that a person can choose right as it's, it's you're born into an ethnicity certainly oh, the argument sorry. can be made i really oh. want to ask you, you something important that i was, was going to ask you before i forgot do you think part of the problem with the whole transracialism and all that and our our, our problem in this country is that black people don't have a language that racialized black people don't have a language outside of the English language. Yeah, but yet they're still not like, so my friends, like I know a guy and he's a black guy in New York city and he's really interesting. He's like, he's on YouTube. I, I've talked to him and his, it's funny, you know, people always say, oh, you know, Asian people hate black people. Don't go to Chinatown, they're really racist. But he speaks fluent Chinese and they love him. And he's like, oh, but you know, like, he's like, you have to show them right? Like there's a challenge. And it's, I think in, in a lot of cultures, it's like, no matter what you are, like, like learning a language is hard. So you're, and that's, what's funny about the, the Korean transracial person. Does the guy speak Korean? Cause he does, he, but Korean, a lot of Koreans, um, I've seen a lot of response videos saying that sometimes when he's uh, he, sometimes he's pretending to speak Korean. He'll say yeah. Korean sounding words, but it'll be like really nonsensical to people who are Korean or speak Korean fluently. Yeah. Um, and uh, so he gets lambasted a lot because he's really presenting himself as Korean in all of these ways, including linguistically, but then he's not even doing that right, apparently. It sounds like he's presenting himself as Korean to people who aren't Korean. Right? It's it, more it, mostly. not Koreans. Right, because he's yeah. not tricking. He's not tricking, at, yeah. you know, people yeah, who are. But I, I think it, he had an interest. He had, he, like, I was really interested in his perspective because he was like, you know, learning Chinese is so hard. 
that you do that and you're in like that's the challenge right and so is it like if you have an ethnic identity and like is it that like there's not a there's not a good enough way to like charge somebody up and see like okay are you real and like if you have language then you have that but like and also because of like the media and the elite call like we don't have an agreed upon thing of even what to test somebody on to make sure that they're like legit right but like language gives you it like language clarifies ethnicity really well like even friends of mine who i mean i ran track with a guy from eastern europe i was thought he was kind of racist he was like lithuanian but then you know, i was like what if like a black dude moves there he's like now he's not really lithuanian and i was like but what if you learn and then his final thing was like yeah i guess if he learns if he learns the language he's one of us right it's like a way to say like okay yeah if you really want it you can have it but like i'm protective of my culture my ethnicity but if, if, if you just gotta really show me and so like the fact that we don't have that in this country we have like highly different groups speaking the same language that yeah makes it Which, difficult maybe um well to me i was going to say you know because because we do have language it's, it's english mostly not yeah. i can't even say like all people racialized black people in america um that english would be their first and foremost language but I think that part of the part of the quagmire that persists for for many people in this country is the fact that English is the language of the of the the former colonizer in a way. Right. So we've been um, our originating languages. We've been stripped of those languages and then we've adopted the English language and we've helped create this sort of American English. Right. But um but then there's all this talk of, you know, standard English versus AAVE, African-American vernacular English. There's all of this other, this effort to uphold the idea of race through how one participates in a culture, which I think is part of upholding the problem. Um, because most ultimately, because race doesn't produce culture, largely because race doesn't exist, uh, there's a way in which when I'm speaking standard English, there's a, a, a well-known belief around the country that I'm trying to speak white or I'm trying to talk white or I'm talking white Yeah. because I'm speaking the standard English. And again, that's evidence for racism masquerading itself because how is it that there is a, 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 a standard English and how is the standard English something that I'm not assigned to or, or presumed to be speaking or else I'm trying to be something else that I'm not when this is my language, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, so I think that that's, yeah, I think it's all intertwined. But um, just before, before I I forget, I want to circle back to this question about ethnicity. So yeah. it, it there is a, um, a general understanding of fluidity um, and malleability that and choice that comes with how people conceive of ethnicity that includes some of the things that people put into and package into the idea of race, which is why, I mean, not for nothing in American society, the census, it'll ask you your race or ethnicity as if it's the same thing right I think that conflation is very intentional and devious and I think that we need to recognize it for what it is and get away get away it's often used as sub race which is wrong right that's not that that's no more positive than race like the term there's a term called an ethnic Albanian and it's like well is he Albanian or is he ethnic Albanian right Right. it's like yeah like I I I think that I, I agree with you that that ethnicity can be positive because it's something that, yeah, you probably are born into, but if you want to work hard and be some other, if to be a different ethnicity, you can, right? It does, it, it should take some work, right? Like it, it's not simple because there's a lot of things you have to like learn, right? But it's basically shared knowledge among a group of people. Right. But like, I don't like the idea that, like, I think it's good that Canelo Alvarez has a Mexican ethnicity. And if there's an American ethnicity, it, it's, it's maybe not the ethnicity on the census, the, the thing that, that you're talking about, but it's like certainly the ethnicity that, that you're born into is just a, if, if, if that's all it is, it's just another race, right? right? It's just a sub race. Mm-hmm. That ethnicity sucks like that. That one's even funnier in some ways. Like it's even more ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. Um, somebody asked, oh, what the fuck's going on? Um, somebody asked, um, so a question about, you know, at this, 
ethnicity and nationality. So I think it's I think it's both things. American could be ethnicity. I think it is ethnicity, and I and I think I mean obviously it's nationality, or perhaps that's um, a, a sort of redundant point. Um, but to the questioner, yeah, I think it's both, and. Also, and then, okay, so Wolf, I definitely want to tend to your question here. How do we incorporate cultural differences into a racelessness ideology? So this is question, this question and this type of question is a question I get a lot. And I always go back to the point about how race does not determine or predetermine culture. Culture creates race. So in that way, we're actually precluded from seeing both cultural similarities and cultural differences and from understanding cultural formation and more generative and realistic ways because we attach uh, we attach and, and conflate race with culture. So with the removal of racism, we would then have a more proliferated understanding of how culture actually does come to be formed. I, I am inspired by the likes of Derek Walcott or Edward Glissant, who are West Indian um, and Caribbean intellectuals who talk about the what, what Glissant calls a rhizomatic identity. Um, part of what is at the core of what Tade and I have been speaking about is the fact that in American society, and I think this is largely a western tendency there is this tendency or fixation to search for what people conceive to be a single origin so this desire the reason we go so far back right is because we're we're seeking the single origin and in a lot of ways that kind of way of thinking and that kind of way of looking at ourselves has then precluded us from the complexity that that culture actually is and how these things get for, formulated and how ethnicity gets formed. Glissant, when he talks about rhizome identity, he, talks of, he dispels the notion and the neatness of this single origin. He talks about how because of the violence of the Middle Passage and, and the, the, the history that ensued from that point on, that the, there's something traumatic and something violent about that happening, but that there was something fruitful that happens as well. And that that fruitfulness is the, being able to recognize how a, an entirely new culture was created from that violent contact and that that new culture, it's multidirectional. So you have the enslaved people, you have the indigenous people, and you have the mostly Europeans who are in contact with each other in these, again, violent and traumatic ways, yes, but also the culture goes like this. It's <laughs> it's not, it, this isn't even neat enough. It's like cyclical, it's all the things. And so there's this like messiness, but then there's this also, this also new thing, this new entity, this new culture that is then created. Um, and I think in the American society, that kind of conceptualization of culture can be um, meaningful and, and fruitful because it can help us recognize how, while we feel inspired to, to segregate how we think of ourselves and segregate how we think of ourselves compared to people we identify as not us, um, what the actual reality, what's closer to reality is a recognition of American culture being a, an amalgamation, not a melting pot, right? It's not, it's not hegemonic. It's not homo, homogenous. It's, it's an amalgamation of all of these different components with various origins that make, um, if you will, a single origin for many of us who are born in American society. But that, that, that recognition uh, because of the fact that it's it's rhizomatic in nature, um, would act, it would be I think a more realistic and a more fruitful way to to think about ourselves and think about each other. And I think it would place what people call black in its rightful position in the American mind and imagination and in popular discourse. Because ultimately, what people call black history is American history. Why do some people resist the, the inclusion of teaching, you know, the problematic history of American society um, in American schools? Well, in part because we've relegated that to Black history. 
we've relegated the 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 darkness in some ways to a, a month we've relegated it to something alien from America. We've accepted the idea that American to be American is to be white and everyone else gets hyphenated. Everyone else is outside of that. So then when we, when we push for and argue for a, a racial reconciliation in American society, it is precluded in some ways because our entanglement is remains obscured. And I think the embracement of the entanglement as Glissant and Walcott and Kamau Harris, uh, uh, Brathwaite, a whole bunch of people in the Caribbean um, discourse uh, push for and expose and elevate recognition of that entanglement in more productive ways like we've sort of touched on here would lead to a better understanding of ourselves, a better acceptance of ourselves and each other, and a recognition of similarities and dissimilarities that exist, but get still obscured because of this idea of race. Yeah, I mean, I think that from genetics, you have a good argument. I, I don't know if you're aware of it. Have you heard of the concept of lost ancestors? Have you heard anything about this? No. Okay, so simply, let's say that uh, you and I are siblings. I'm your brother. And then, so you, you may have heard this before, but you probably, you share half your DNA with, with your dad and half with your mom. If you're, ma- if you're male, you actually share a little less with your dad because the Y chromosome, it doesn't code for very much. And also you have a mitochondria for your mom, but that's just, just to, to, to make things simple, we're getting ignore all the sex chromosomes and stuff and the mitochondria and say, okay, you're half mom, half your dad. And there's no way around that, right? Yeah, because you get half your chromosomes from, from your mom and half from your dad. And your dad got half of his from his mom and half from his dad and, and so forth. But let's say that I'm your brother. Well, how much DNA do we share? Well, on, on average, half. But and all, we're also going to ignore something called recombinations. So if there's geneticists reading this, I'm ignoring that. But it doesn't really change the math too much, right? So what if for every chromosome that you got from, from our dad, I got the other one. And for every chromosome that you got from your mom, I got the other one. Now that's unlikely, right? There's 22 chromosomes. So the chance of that is one fifth to the 22nd power, right? That we happen to get a different one each time. But you could easily imagine that maybe like we got a, a different one more than average. So we may only share say 55% or, or 45% of our DNA. If we have another sibling, he might be more like me or more like you, right? So even within siblings, this 50% thing's not true, right? So it's around 50%, on average. So it's only true for parents and kids. Kids share half their parents' DNA, but they don't share half their siblings' DNA, and they don't share a fourth of each of their grandparents' DNA, right? Because your your mom could could, have, again, the chance is very low, but your mom could have gave you only the chromosomes that she got from her dad. In that case, your grandmother's gone. Now, that's not going to happen because, again, the, the chance is too low. But, but as you go back, as you go back into around number by five or six, right, your six grandmother, so great, great for six times grandmother. By the time you get there, you, you start to share, you know, on average, 1% of your DNA, but on average, 1% is sometimes zero. So you start to drop out. You start, so as you go back in your tree, like this is an ancestor who gave you nothing. We didn't give you any DNA, right? So you say like, these are my people. Well, that person was there. The person is in your, in, in your family tree, but you don't have any of their, like their DNA is not in you. And that starts to happen more and more. By the time you get to like your ninth and your 10th and like your 12th, it obviously expands it becomes almost the whole world, but you start to have a bunch of dropouts. And so what I think is really interesting is if you're looking back, I mean, six, six, six generations isn't that long ago, right? So it's like, by the time that you're looking at your people, six times you move, those aren't really your people, but they are your people because they had influence on your people, right? So even if you're sure that you have no admixture, like no one in my family is, is like European, everyone is from Africa. I have a friend, she's Nigerian, she swears by this, you know, like even if that's true, you still have white ancestors because you have white people that influenced your family, right? You have people that, inf- and that's really a lot, and, and a lot of your genealogical ancestors are not genetic ancestors. So yeah, you call them ancestors because they're in your like they're in your tree, they're gene, but that's just because they're important. That's just because they had influence. So I think that it's totally would it's not 
anti-scientific to say that like as it like yeah not maybe people's parents that aren't yours but as you start going back the people that came basically like that's why i think it's it's really about who like who you've met right when, when it gets to before before you've met them you have like you can kind of consider everybody from six like six generations ago that had any influence on anybody else that made you your ancestor right which which i think is so that's how i think you should conceptualize your identity is whoever and if you live in the us and i mean if you've been here for a while it depends when you, your parents came but if you've been here for a while then you're definitely influenced by black people and white people and all kinds of people right so you actually are mixed right so your identity is mixed up right so like you're you, you've been influenced and touched by all these people so i i think it's actually like supported scientifically to realize that you can't stick with genetic a genetic ancestor as someone in your past like these people in your past who are not genetic and you don't know who's who so so like when you you know if you, if you find out that you're related to um to i don't know um who's somebody really old like uh i don't know some king like the the queen of england or something like uh what's like the what's what's the one who who got the uh Anne Boleyn right from like 1200 like if let, let's say that you find out you trace your and that's your ancestor and then like you see a statue and you feel something it's probably actually you probably she probably didn't give you any like any DNA at all so you're just as much related to like her best friend as you are to her you know or you're just as much related to like the the woman that the king liked more but you know but but, but was never with as you are to her like they really are right so i think that's a more it's actually like scientifically true so i think i think that helps sort of make that even and that's an even stronger argument for why yeah your identity isn't it's not even it's not even that clean Pene, we have to continue this yeah. clearly um clearly we both have a lot to say um to each other which i think is a great a great I thing know, I, I learned so much from you today it's really amazing like it is it's good and not Same. just like, like, you know, I learn a lot from other people, but usually I learn about a book I should read, but I've learned ideas, which is rare, right? It's like, oh, wow, I've never thought of it like that. That makes sense. You know, that, that feels good. So well, thank you. Yeah. High praise, high praise, yeah. because clearly, you know, a lot. And I learn from you uh, virtually every time you say something or I see a tweet, you know, uh, which, thank by you. the way, if you want people to find you on Twitter, I'm happy to put that in the in the description box. Um, but, yeah, we should definitely do this again. I think a second conversation would would allow us to find me because my name on twitter is my name and it's this, this yeah someone else has this name <laughs> right and it's yeah. right it's right in the left hand corner yeah. of the yeah. of the youtube screen yeah um thank you so much for joining me, me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you amazing. yeah um thank you to everyone for joining us and following along especially those of you who are the real mvps for staying with us the entire time yeah, didn't intend fun. to necessarily go this long but it, it happens right yeah. um and uh thanks to everyone who have also been with me for for longer than just today i appreciate your support i actually need it to continue doing this type of work bringing this these types of conversations and th these ideas to you requires your support both you know in the chat box hit the thumbs up subscribe comment share this video um if you are not a patreon the link to that information to, to that will be in the website. Consider supporting. You can support for as little as $5 a month. It helps me bring this content to you. Shout out to my current patrons, um, Mike, Steve, Brookie. I love you all so much. Thank you for your support. And I hope to see you in the next one. Like I said, definitely a part two. And if I didn't tend to your questions, I did copy and paste the chat into Word doc and I'm starting a Q&A series on my channel because I get a lot of questions as it pertains to theory of racelessness. And I want to share my responses to those questions as publicly as possible because if you have a question about it, you're probably not the only person with the question. So something else to look forward to on this channel. Tade, thank you again yeah. so much. Be Thanks well, so much. everyone. That was great. I'll talk to you later.